All right, good evening. I now call the uh, December 21st meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. Uh, this open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all public meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So I'd like to confirm that all members of the board are present and can hear me. If you could answer by saying here, Ken Lau. Here. David Watson. Here. Jean Benson. Here. Katie Levine Einstein. Here. And we have Jenny Rate from the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Here. And uh, Aaron Zwerko. Here. And I think I saw Kelly Linema's name on there as well. Here, hello. Hi, do we have anyone else from the department? Nope, okay, great. Uh, oh, and myself, I'm Rachel Zemberry. <laughs> I am present as well, clearly. Uh, the first docket on our agenda is uh, docket number 3640, 86 River Street, which is um, a, an open public hearing for a new, uh, for new proposed signage. Uh, Jenny, do you have anything that you'd like to state before we call the applicant? Uh, we, we actually don't see the applicant here. <laughs> um, oh. So, uh, Aaron, do you see them anywhere? Uh, no, I'm scanning the list of attendees and I do not see um, the applicant nor the sign contractor's name in the list of attendees. Um, I did uh, notify them of the hearing and okay. that their attendance should be, um, they should attend uh, last week. Okay. Um, we could skip ahead maybe to the meeting minutes up to you that we could wait uh, we will we'll send a note real quick okay well why don't we give them another minute or two and then i think i don't want to take the next docket number out of order um but no, we that's a, that's a published hearing time right, exactly so we, we can't do that anyway right so i think we could do the meeting minutes um we'll give them let me look at my here. We'll give them another two minutes. And then maybe we'll go to the meeting minutes. Let's see if there are any other administrative things that we can get done. So bear with us just another minute or two. Do you wanna do the meeting minutes while we're waiting? Uh, we could. So why don't we bring up, uh, we'll move to agenda item number three, the meeting minutes from September 21st, 2020, which was the joint meeting with the, of the redevelopment board with the select board. Uh, so I will take a roll call to see if any members of the board have any additions or corrections to the meeting, starting with Ken. Ken, did you have any additions? Yes. Okay, great. I, I, I couldn't find my unmute That's button. okay, thanks. Uh, I had one and... On page two, um, one, two, three, four. On the fifth paragraph down. Yeah. 
you got that, Jamie, or? Sorry, I muted myself, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I like to change the word performance to decisions. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what I was asking for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to get the feedback regarding the Re Read Our Own Board's decisions over the past year, not performance. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Uh, um, I have just one. It's more a wording change. The third paragraph on the first page, the second or the third sentence starts with the issues discussed were colon. And then at the very end, it shouldn't say discussed an outreach strategy. The word discussed should be replaced with the word and. That's my only change. So. Oh, got it. Yes, I see that. Thank you. That's the only change I have. Great. Thank you, Jean. David? Uh, I had one uh, possible change. It's on page two in the third full paragraph that starts out third to be asked. Uh, in the middle of that paragraph, there's a sentence that says, Mr. Watson said that the pandemic may have increased the urgency of housing development in Arlington. I didn't get a chance to go back and uh, look to see exactly what I said, but it would make more sense to me if that was uh, referring to the urgency of affordable housing development. Thank you, David. Uh, do you have anything else? No, I don't. Thank you. Uh, Katie? No changes. Thank you. And the only item I had, um, which appears in the PDF version, which is on page four in the first paragraph, there are a few um, times where uh, Jennifer Seuss's name is underlined, and I'm assuming that the emphasis was <laughs> No, just, uh, I was probably Great. correcting it at the time, <laughs> yep. the spelling, which is correct now. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's all that I had. Let's see. So um, are, are there any other changes before we call for a motion? Okay. Do we hear a motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes from September 21st, 2020 as amended? So moved. Second. We'll take a roll call vote for approval. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am yes as well. Great. All right, we've 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 tried to reach the applicant and so far no luck. So um, for uh, 86 River Street, Okay, um, so Aaron is actually the one who was doing that. So Aaron, would you mind um, weighing in, please? Yeah, of course. Um, I emailed the sign contractor um, and did not, you know, I, well, I emailed him on Thursday um, and then just emailed him again, did not receive a response, tried the phone number and it was the office line um, being that it's 7 p.m. No one picked up. Um, so I, I have not been able to get in contact with anyone at this time um, relative to this item, um, nor do I see uh, the name of the signed contractor or the owner who I do not have an email address for listed in the participant list. So at this point, um, we probably should continue this this hearing, Jenny. And without them being here to weigh in on the the date, um, I'm assuming that we could identify a date. And then, if they need us to push it further, we could always do so with that that next date. I think we'll just just continue it to uh, January fourth is probably the best measure. Okay. At this point. Great. And then we will. Um, I'm just going to take a pause until 7.30 when we can hear item number two. Um, so do I hear a motion to continue uh, docket 3640 until 
of the January 4th redevelopment board hearing. So motioned. Is there a second? Uh, okay. Great, thank you. We'll take a roll call vote to continue the hearing. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Okay, given the published times, I think that that's all that we can do now. Um, so we will take a break and uh, reconvene at uh, 7.30. All right, it is 7.30. So we will now move to uh, docket number 3638, the continued public hearing for 400 to 402 Massachusetts Avenue. Thank you everyone for bearing with us during our break um, as we did not have the applicant in attendance for the first agenda item. Before we turn it over to the applicant, uh, Jenny, I will check and see if there's anything that you wanted to um, address the board with regard regarding this item. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think the applicant and their attorney and possibly the owner, they're all here. Um, the only thing I wanna mention is that I had some correspondence uh, from Steve Michalka, the chair of the Arlington Historic Districts Commission. And we talked about how the applicant in their uh, revision in response to the board's comments had incorporated sort of a, a new structure on the property um, and that they wanted to remind us that that falls under their purview um, to approve such structures. Um, I will note, however, that the, the design guidelines from the Historic Districts Commission don't say anything, it doesn't provide specific guidance about these types of structures for the board. So I would recommend, and Steve um, concurred at least by email, um, not as a vote of the board or the commission in any way, but that we would of course reference in any decision that we decide to make, if you do, um, that we would have the Historic Districts Commission approve. Uh, they would need to review and approve that any um, exterior additions or anything that the board is requiring um, and have a certificate of appropriateness issued before any uh, anything could proceed. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was, um, you know, this was something that was, the applicant was being responsive to the board, uh, but just to remind the board that it is an historic district, it's not quite the same as the historical commission where we can, um, you know, we might, we might have a little more uh, we might do things a little bit differently. In this case, the Historic Districts Commission would need to review any sort of structure on the property. Great, thank you for the reminder, Jenny. Um, let's see, do we have, so who from the applicant uh, do we have on the Zoom call today who would like to speak on behalf? We have Bob and Nessie and I see Ken and I see Cynthia. I, I think Bob might have stepped away, but Ken is nodding his head. Yes, I know uh, Bob and Nessie was, uh, wanted to actually start the presentation um, when we talked earlier today. This is Ken File, the architect. Hi, Ken. Do you think Hi. you could uh, get Bob back on the, on the line with us? Yep, I will. That would be great. I, We're looking for two so far tonight. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, let me uh, let me reach out to him right now. My Thank apologies. Thank you very much. All right, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can. Uh, hi. <laughs> okay. okay, good. All right, uh, are we ready, Rachel? Please go ahead. If you could introduce yourself, yeah. and then um, please go ahead and make any opening remarks that you'd like All to. Right. Yes. So after last the last meeting we had uh, on December seven, I had a long discussion with my clients. And I had a discussion with Ken Feel, who is uh, here as well, the architect. And we discussed the whole approach that uh, we had taken with respect to the property. And uh, I wanna bring to the attention of the members of the board again, uh, the size of the lot, okay? I wanna bring to the attention uh, of the members of, uh, to the members of the board, uh, the size of the building. And by the way, the, if you look in the assessing record for the town, the building uh, apparently, or portions of the building, were built way back in 1791, according to the assessing record. Uh, so the building goes way back, and the building has been used for mixed uh, business and historical uses over the years. 
Now, one of the concerns on the part of the Pescudo family, and as you know, they have just done the A Day 2 Mass Ave property, uh, and they invested and have invested and will invest uh, substantial money in that project. And they have done that because they know that they're going to see a reasonable return uh, with respect to their investment. Uh, they know that there's a market for the residential units that they will be able to rent. And they know that they will be able to receive income, uh, which will basically help them with respect to what they had to pay to construct the building. Now, they also have other properties in town that are commercial-like properties. And they have vacancies, have had vacancies, will continue to have vacancies with those properties. So the driving force with them with respect to what they are trying to achieve is they're trying to uh, basically do some things with this property, uh, but they want to do it in such a way that they're going to again have a return with respect to their investment. Uh, when we last met on December 7, uh, at least three members of the board uh, were of the view and may still be of the view, I don't know, uh, that uh, the four residential units we were seeking should be reduced to three. Now, since that time, I have done my own research uh, with respect to uh, office units, uh, whether in town and elsewhere. And I do, I do know, uh, and I bring to your attention, and I recognize the fact that I cited an article in the New York Times that talks about uh, Manhattan and talks about vacancies in Manhattan. Now, Manhattan is not Arlington. I concede that. But the thinking process that is going to be gone through in Manhattan is the very same thinking process that is going to take place in cities and towns. And that is that since the pandemic, we're living in a different world at this point. The world we're living in now is that for the last six to seven to eight months, Employee, many employees have not been going back to brick and mortar premises, but rather are working by Zoom offsite, uh, probably from home. The, uh, the uh, New York Times article that I cited basically uh, indicates that that is probably going to continue and that many square feet of prime, uh, prior office space in Manhattan is going to be converted to residential space. Why? Because again, even after the pandemia, uh, pandemia is, is over, that uh, folks, uh, employees, are not going to be going back to a physical plant. And employers are not going to want them to come back because the employers are not going to want to be paying rent for office space that could be utilized in a different way that is by having employees working from home. Uh, the, um, uh, the, if the employers own the building, they're gonna be wanting to convert those buildings to residential space. Now, we can extrapolate that, and we have, by getting an opinion letter from a local broker, a broker from Andover, who basically uh, essentially has said the same thing uh, and uh, that, that broker, you have a copy of the report uh, that I gave you from that broker. And basically he says, the ability to work remotely has become a major factor and in incentive to attracting a strong, dynamic and tech savvy workforce. The need for a traditional office has diminished greatly over the last few years. And I think that has to be looked at in the context of who are the people who are going to be populating uh, the, uh, the, the employer's so-called workspace? And I'm not talking about workspace on site. These are gonna be younger people who are going to be very tech savvy and they're going to have the ability to work remotely. Uh, older folks uh, uh, like myself, for example, uh, don't quite have that ability, but uh, I think the younger folks do, 
and the uh, younger folks will as time goes on. So this particular broker indicates that uh, uh, companies, both large and small, have realized they no longer need a physical presence. Uh, and he further indicates that, uh, uh, that in fact, office space uh, is going to be much more difficult to rent than residential space. And that, again, that comes back to what an investor, forget about the Viscuto family, what is an investor going to be willing to invest their money into with respect to uh, uh, expecting a return? It doesn't have to be a killing, but a return so they're not losing money. And I think the, if you, if you re read the New York Times article I submitted, and if you read the report from the uh, uh, broker from Andover, I think the answer is that uh, uh, in investors are going to want to go residential and not uh, uh, office. Now, uh, we know that we have a bylaw that is a mixed-use bylaw. Uh, when this case was first heard by the zoning board back in 1980, there was no mixed use bylaw. Uh, and at that time, the zoning bylaw said you could have two residential units and two parking spaces. Well, all of that has changed. And it's changed uh, in the context again of the crisis we've had for the last seven to eight months which brings about even a more significant change about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so from the point of view of an investor, uh, whether it be the Piscuto family or some other developer, again, why, and why are, they, are they going to spend money uh, on uh, to basically rehab a building? And essentially that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to rehab a building to rehab a building and have an office space that they probably won't be able to rent. Or if they are able to rent it, it'll take a substantial period of time to do that. Uh, now, going back to the discussion we had at the time of the hearing, uh, there are a number of uh, items that, uh, that were talked about. One of them was the trash issue. And uh, we have endeavored to uh, address that issue, as uh, you can see from looking at the plan, by eliminating one of the six parking spaces and bringing it down to five and having that trash enclosure area stand on its own and some distance away uh, actually from the building, unlike what we had before. Uh, there was also discussion uh, uh, at the last hearing about the parking configuration at the property with respect to vehicles parking out onto the street. I'm going to suggest to you that that's what's been happening with the building over the last number of years. Uh, none, none of that has changed. Uh, parking, uh, backing out onto Avon uh, has occurred. Uh, and uh, that's what we're, we're contemplating as well. Now, can we do anything about that? We can't. We can't because of the configuration of the lot, okay? The way the lot sets up, there's no way we can change that arrangement, change either the parking arrangement or change the backing out onto the street. And again, I cite in my, and I know that we heard a comment from Mr. Benson last time about the fact that there's a provision in the bylaw that basically uh, frowns upon backing out on, onto the street. Uh, and I agree with that. There is a provision, okay? But in, in these times, and particularly with mixed use, I think that we need to be, and, and, and the board does have the ability, and we talked about this at the time of the 882 Mass Ave hearing, the board does have the ability to be creative, and the board does have the ability to grant concessions in terms of what is being proposed under mixed use. So I'm suggesting to the members of the board that they can in fact grant relief with respect to backing out onto Avon and they can in fact grant relief with respect to the parking. The parking is tandem parking. 
Go down into East Arlington, go down to almost any street in East Arlington, and you're going to see ample uh, examples of tandem parking. That's what happens when you have I, small- I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to see, we are really tight on time tonight, right. and, I, and I just wanted to see if there are any other major points that you would like to make. Well, I just want to make sure you, you cover them all. Let me just quick, quickly make Thank them. you so much. All right, okay. Uh, that was one of the issues, okay? There was some discussion from Ken about uh, uh, drainage, and I think Ken will talk. I think we lost, I think we lost Bob. So Ken, I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and cover the, the drainage issues yeah. so we can move into sure. board discussion. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's where Bob was leading anyway. Um, yeah, so, you know, based on the conversations we had, you know, from the last presentation, um, you know, as we, um, I guess if you could, if, if we could flip to uh, A101, the next sheet, you could use the same location, uh, upper right-hand corner. Perfect. And, oh, Bob is muted. He's back. Why don't you go ahead and, and finish your okay. thought here, and then we'll, we'll ask okay. Bob if he has anything to close. Thank you. Sure. Um, on regarding the drainage, um, around the entire building, about two and a three quarter sides of the building is uh, paved right up to the building. Um, at the front left hand corner, the entire front, um, that's where we have landscaped areas and where downspouts currently um, discharge water into the landscaped areas. Um, in the front right-hand corner, there is a downspout to the building that um, currently discharges to the shared to the driveway to the right of the building, and we are proposing to redirect that water discharge into the landscaped area in the front right-hand corner. Uh, but unfortunately, around the back and the shared the the paved driveway between the two buildings on the right hand on the right-hand side um, and the rear of the building, there's no opportunity to redirect the water from what it currently, um, the way it currently is configured and discharges uh, without significant landscape modifications that, as I understand, we're, we're just not prepared to do at this moment. Um, and I think Bob was also gonna get into, um, we were talking about uh, bicycle storage. Um, we are still proposing to have three temporary bike rack, three bike racks for temporary use. Um, at the side of the uh, the property by the walkway uh, in the upper left-hand corner by uh, parking spot number four. Um, and we are st still looking to put bike storage in the existing um, building storage location at the bottom of the stairs. We know there was, uh, we understand that getting, bringing bikes up and down stairs is not the most easiest thing, but to even get into the building, um, tenants have to go upstairs. Um, and currently the, the upstairs, the top floor tenants, um, bring their bikes all the way up to their, up to their, um, to their units. And we, we feel that bringing the bikes down a set of stairs after coming, getting into the building, um, is less obtrusive. And there is already, uh, building storage in that lower level, uh, reconfiguring to put bike storage on the, we'll call it the first level. Um, takes up incredibly valuable real estate on that level. That's more highly used. It's the highest and best use would be for for rentable square footage that is part of a unit. And so um, we feel that the best solution for us to provide um, covered permanent bike storage would be at the lower level in the building storage. Um, those are the pieces that uh, I know Bob wanted me to cover, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Bob with that. Great. Thank you. Bob, do you have anything oh. to wrap up? Oh, he's still muted. Still muted. Oh, he's getting assistance right now. Someone to help him. Yep. Yes, thank you. He's muting it. Am I unmuted now? You are unmuted. If you have anything. No, add, I think we've covered it. I think that we've had uh, our say, and... Uh, I'm respectfully requesting uh, that the board uh, consider what we've submitted and uh, perhaps reconsider at least three members 
uh, reconsider their uh, determination, not their determination, uh, but their thinking last time that, that uh, we should not have four residential, but rather three residential units. Great, thank you, Mr. Anessi. All right, I'm going to turn it over to members of the board for questions to the applicants about the new material. Um, I do want to mention to both the board and to those giving public comment that we will be starting the public forum at 8.30 this evening. So please make sure that you are um, bringing new questions uh, rather than repetitive questions. Fourth, um, the board, we will hold our discussion until after questions are posed by the board and public comment has been received. So we'll start with Ken. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Uh, on the lower level. Yeah. Uh, one of my comments was uh, to flip the bedroom and um, and the living room so that the, uh, the living room had three windows and the bedroom had one window. Um, your decision not to do that was for. Ken, can you address that for us, please? Yes, I forgot to change the layout. I can rework. You, we are agreeing I can, to I, do I, that. I, I, yes, I could, I could rework yeah. that. I apologize for not changing the plan. Yeah. Okay, because I, I, I know um, Gene did speak up about having, uh, having uh, windows in a bedroom. It would be nice, and he enjoys that. But I think uh, proportionally and, and being able to rent it, that living room space having three windows it would be much nicer. We will uh, do that, Ken. Understood. Yeah, I, my apologies. Okay. I, I just didn't think, I, I couldn't know what, what you're not doing. Um, Understood. Understood. I really don't have any other questions except for the fact that uh, I'm, I'm still supportive of this project. I believe that, that uh, you just taken a mixed use, an existing mixed use building and just changing the proportions of the mixed use. And I, I like this fact that you're respecting this existing historic building and not tearing it down or making modifications to it. And uh, I think that's a noble approach. And uh, I will support you in this project because I think this is a good way of, of doing this and still making uh, financial sense because uh, this is a business. Thank you, Ken. David? Rachel, I don't have any questions, more of a comment, and I didn't know if you wanted us to hold those yeah, until if after. If it's related to a discussion that you'd like to have with the rest of the board, I'd, I'd prefer if we could hold that and get through public comment um, before we engage in discussion, if you don't mind. That's fine. Thank you, David. Jean? Thank you, Rachel. I, I have one question. Talk about the ease or difficulty of flipping the um, bicycle storage room with the laundry, because as I see it, there's an external door to the laundry, which would allow, it looks like roll in, roll out bicycle storage in what's now the laundry room. So can you talk about the ease or difficulty of moving the laundry to where you're proposing the bicycle storage and moving the bicycle storage to where the laundry is now? Ken? Sure. Uh, I'm currently in that laundry room. I mean, there's, there's, it's a, also a utility room as well. That's where the utilities for the building come into as well. Um, and it, there is a few steps going down okay. to that, um, to the, that lower, uh, to that laundry room from the exterior. Um, it would, would it be less steps? Absolutely. But I don't think we would get as many um, bicycles in that location if we move the dryers and washing machines from that unit to the building storage area. Um, a lot of that lower level of the laundry room is taken up with utilities. What do you mean by utilities? Can you say what's in there? Um, oh, electricity, water, um, and I believe gas as well. Okay, I know the questions. I'll save my comments for when we have discussion. Thank you, Jean. Katie, any questions? 
No questions. I'll save comments like the others for our discussion time. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we will now open uh, this docket for public comment. So any wish member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function, which is in the participants button uh, at the bottom of your screen. I will call on you in the order that the hands are raised. Um, once you have been called upon, please state your name and address for the record, and you will have three minutes to speak. The first speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, 104 Irving Street. Um, I'd like to remind the board that it was just last month that you had before it a very similar application for 1500 Mass Ave. Both proposals are in the B1 neighborhood office district. Both request changing the use from two apartment units to four. Both are on lots that are far too small to accommodate four apartments under our standard zoning bylaws um, and are relying on the mixed use definition by including a first floor office space. A key difference is that 1500 Mass Ave started out with no commercial space and wanted to add an office. 400 Mass Ave, on the other hand, already has three office spaces and is proposing to cut it to just one. When the first hearing was held for 1500 Mass Ave, there were objections raised that the office space that was proposed was being included simply to take advantage of the less restrictive mixed use requirements. To quote one of the board members, I don't know that that's enough space to be viable. I'm just concerned that you're going to end up with vacant space on the first floor and the apartments above. The board requested a market analysis. At the next hearing, uh, Mr. Anessi assured the board that small rental spaces were indeed viable in Arlington. In fact, even smaller spaces were feasible. Quoting Mr. Anessi, I spoke with one of the well-versed real estate brokers in town, Robert Bowes. Our office space is being proposed at 475 square feet, and I'm given to understand in speaking with Mr. Bowes that the rent we could get for that office space would be approximately $1,000 per month. So we think that it is a viable proposal to have that kind of office space in the building. This board rejected an option presented of having a first floor apartment unit and approved the proposal with the first floor devoted only to commercial office space, accepting the applicant's claim that this was economically viable and not simply a loophole to use the mixed use label to build an apartment building. But now less than two months later, a new applicant is telling a quite different story. They want to slash the existing commercial office space by 75% to leave a small token space to legitimatize the mixed use label. They have essentially declared that they have little expectation that it will be truly mixed use. According to Mr. Anessi this evening, there is no future for the commercial market in Arlington and the applicants are filing this special permit request. So quote, so that, that they do not wind up with another vacant commercial unit. Mr. Seltzer, your, your time is up. If you could wrap up, please. Uh, certainly. I, I want to point out, you did give the applicant three times their allocation. If you could give me maybe 30 seconds more. Uh, I asked, I was very clear that everyone would have three minutes in the public to speak. So please wrap up. Thank you. Okay. This is a disturbing pattern developing here. A major lord, landlord of commercial properties in town wants to get out of that business. It started with the gutting of the Torreya block. It continues with this building. And one doesn't need a crystal ball to predict what will occur next year. This Thank board you, will Seltzer. say the same applicant seeking the permission next... to gut the heart of the East Arlington business. Thank you, district. Mr. Seltzer. The next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Carl Wagner from 30 Edge Hill in Arlington. Um, I just wanted to uh, address my comments to the board that it's very important to remember that the ARB functions for the people and businesses of Arlington. 
And as such, the people and businesses are served when you uphold the bylaws and laws of Arlington. This ruling and the ruling of the hotel earlier in 2020 are shocking in the potential that they could set for um, future uh, businesses and developers like Mr. Anisi to come in and ask for favors and things that are not allowed by our laws. I remind the board and the developer that the purpose of the mixed use law as it was originally set forth is to help provide additional accessory residences to businesses, to help businesses. The ruling originally around this uh, property went in many ways beyond what the law allows, and it certainly now is not meeting the needs of the mixed use law. I ask everyone in looking at this ARB who's on this call today, as well as the public, to consider that we only need to build what is legal in our town or allowed by the ARB. We only need to help our businesses and our residences. And in that regard, this would increase our property tax burdens by increasing residential we need to add more business. We need to help business. We do not need this as it stands. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be John Warden. Okay. Oh, right. uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Th thank, <clears throat> thank you. Um, um, I, um, I've heard Mr. Warden, that, I'm sorry, could you please state your name and address for the record? Oh, I'm sorry, John Thank Word, you. 27 Jason Street. Um, uh, Mr. Inessi has again uh, brought forward, as he's had on previous occasions, the argument that, that, uh, that his, his client can't make enough money if he doesn't do such, get such and such handouts from the, re from the redevelopment board. Um, A, uh, I would say it is not the redevelopment board's job or the job of the town of Arlington to provide profits to any particular developer. Uh, B, no one asked him to make a further investment in this building. He might shovel the sidewalk, by the way. Um, uh, if he wanted to do that, it, it, welcome. Take the, take the vinyl siding off and some of those signs. Uh, C, um, he talks about, the, and he did this before, um, he won't make enough money and because we figured out that he won't. The board, if, if he's gonna rely on that argument and persuade you folks to give him favors because of that argument, he should provide some real numbers, not just say. I mean, I could say, I don't make enough money as, as, as a lawyer. So you, you, I should charge twice as much money, but w without giving you any, any expenses or, or, or any reason why I deserve more money. Um, so, that that argument should not sway the board until you get some real numbers. And then if you look at the, the last uh, uh, thing that was uh, perpetrated, the Torreya block, th there were four or five existing vibrant businesses in there. They tore them down, or the, the process of tearing them down, apparently without a demolition permit. Uh, they don't shovel the sidewalk. Uh, the businesses are gone. And they say, well, now we've got to have an apartment building here with one little shop in the corner. And that's exactly what I said in the 16 town meeting when they talked about mixed use. I said, this is, if you don't have some guidance on this, some, some requirements about the commercial, despite all the golden words, uh, that you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of apartments and one little shop in the corner. And that's what you've allowed at, at 1500 I mean, at, 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 at uh, nine, uh, eight, eight, uh, sorry, eight, 892. Eight, eight, 892. I suppose you'll allow that 1500 and now he wants you to allow it here. And that's not just totally inappropriate. Let's do what mixed use was supposed to do which Mr. Bunnell and Mr. Kayer promised us when they persuaded town meeting to, to vote this without appropriate guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to echo some of the earlier comments. This uh, proposal really seems like an abuse of the mixed use law as it was passed in 2016. And it's quite clear what, what the developer is doing. If, if indeed they want to be entirely residential, the most units they could put there are two because that 
because the lot is so small. So what they're trying to do is get a four unit apartment building in by putting a token amount of office space in the building. And, you know, I fully appreciate that that might be a higher and mixed use. Well, so would a 10 story apartment building, but neither a 10 story apartment building nor a four unit apartment building are allowed in this B1 zoning district. And therefore the redevelopment board has no business granting a special permit for a four unit building. I suggest you take a very close look at that 1980 decision because indeed it shows rigor in the application of the zoning bylaw. The very first finding is that the uses requested are listed in the table of use regulations. You will not find the apart an apartment building listed as an acceptable use in the B1 zoning district that applied in 1980, it applies today as well. The other thing I would um, <clears throat> suggest is that the parking is excessive. There is alternative parking available and even five spaces is too much. The applicant seeks to increase the nonconformity by having this parking, um, you know, allowing or requiring cars to back into the street. That is allowed for one and two family homes. It's not allowed for anything bigger than that. Um, and, and to the point Mr. Warden raised about the exterior, your board really should be looking at the exterior of this building. It's tired, it needs help. And if they're gonna be getting a special permit, a condition should be that that be improved and be restored to something that's more acceptable and, and in particular to the uh, Historic District Commission as well. Finally, I just wanna end with one request and I'll let you answer this question offline. I heard talk at the last hearing about plans for ex parte communications or perhaps even meetings between the developer team and members of the redevelopment board. I would like your, the members of your board to report publicly, one, if any such meetings or conversations took place, and two, what the substance of those meetings or conversations were. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next speaker will be Colleen Cunningham. Hi, it's actually Stuart Gorson, Kensington Park. Colleen is my wife. Thank you. I'm using her computer. I just wanted to say a couple of quick things um, in agreement with what was said earlier. Um, zoning laws exist for a reason and they're to, to encourage certain kinds of development in, in areas in town. And what we're talking about here is an area in Arlington which is in the business district. It's right downtown. Um, and and you know, the, the idea that um, the developer wants to put in residential properties is a short-term interest. Yes, COVID has made office space less valuable now, but that's over the next year or two. Who knows what's gonna happen in five, 10, 20 years. But we're talking about changes to a building which are gonna be, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years long. And so therefore it's really the job of the development board to to keep the long-term interest of Arlington in mind and not just the short-term interest of the developer. And then the final thing I'll, I'll offer, and I think this has been said before, is that there's a really funny kind of socialism going on here, which is that it's the socialism of, you know, the town being asked to guarantee the profits of a, of a real estate speculator, a real estate investor. And I don't know of any other business where you know, the businessman can come to the town and ask for changes to say health laws or other laws in order to support their profits. And so I would, I would suggest that, you know, respectfully that the board keep in mind that um, capitalism and, and business, you know, has risks and it's not up to the town to guarantee that businessmen can make their profits. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this docket number? Seeing none, we will close public comments on docket number 3638 and we'll move to board discussion. Uh, are there any board members who, who wish to, uh, to uh, discuss any particular points? I believe David, you had one item, perhaps you'd like to start. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to debate uh, with, uh, with Mr. Annette, uh, whether uh, there's a need for for more housing in Arlington, we we certainly we certainly agree with that. Um, 
you know, I obviously the pandemic has changed uh, the way people are looking at uh, at real estate today. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but uh, regardless of what may have changed over the last uh, several months with the pandemic, uh, we're still operating under the same mixed use bylaw that we had before. And I continue to have the concern that I expressed at the last hearing uh, that uh, we're uh, looking at a situation where um, the amount of commercial space is being significantly reduced and replaced with residential, and uh, in my view, is is leaving uh, a uh, a token amount of of commercial space in order to take advantage of the mixed use statute. And I don't I don't disagree that turning this building into into residential might be a better use for it, but I feel uh, stuck by. Uh, by what uh, we uh, what the mixed use bylaw is is intended for, and and I don't feel that this project is is a particularly good match uh, for utilizing the mixed use bylaw, regardless of what we think about uh, uh, about what the uh, the proponent is is. Uh, is proposing for the space. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is I, uh, I continue, uh, while I acknowledge that uh, adding bike parking where there is none now uh, is certainly an improvement over the current situation, but uh, you know, the, the reason that we're being told that, that uh, they can't uh, comply with the bike parking bylaw in terms of the location of the bike parking is is purely cost, uh, and I and I and I don't I don't know that I feel that that's a sufficient reason to allow a deviation from what the bylaw uh, expressly prohibits, which is uh, having to require people to carry their bikes up and down the stairs. So th those were my comments. Thank you, David. Uh, are there comments from other members of the of the board? Jean? I, I pretty much agree with what David had to say. Um, I will I will add that I think comparing small office space in Arlington to huge office buildings in Midtown Manhattan is a really false equivalence. And the market between the two is not at all comparable. Um, and the people who will need these little offices are not the same entities that occupy large buildings in Manhattan or Boston for that matter. Um, there's also been a lot in the news about the impact of the pandemic on the residential rental market too. And there's a significant uncertainty <clears throat> now. And I did a little research and there are a significant number of uh, residential units for rent in Arlington. At the moment, too, a lot of it has to do with um, the pandemic and students not being in town and, you and the me? like at the moment. So Can you there's, hear a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty um, in both areas. So um, I'm pretty much in agreement with everything David had to say, and I'll just add those other points that I made. Is there any other discussion before we um, move to either a, a motion to continue or to vote? Okay. Um, so, Mr. Anessi, given the the split here of the of the board, mm -hmm. I will leave it up 
up to you. We can we can vote on on this. Tonight. No, I, I think under the circumstances, I certainly would uh, be requesting uh, uh, Cynthia, if you're on, uh, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I would be requesting that the matter be continued so that I can have a further opportunity to consult with my client. Cynthia, would you agree with that? She may not be able to hear me. Uh, that's agreed. what it would be. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. All right. So we're agreed. We'll be asking for a continuance so that we can further consult. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Jenny, I believe that the next date is January 4th. Is there room on, on that agenda? Sure. To continue this? So yes. Ms. Mr. Anessi, would that give you enough time to consult with your client or would you like to look at the next date following the 4th? What's the date after the 4th? Jenny. The 4th is probably going to work, okay? But what is the date after the 4th, if you know what it is? Sorry, I'm, um, it's the 25th. Uh, yeah, well, the 4th. Why don't we go with the 4th? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So do I have a motion to continue the hearing to January 4th? I'll move. Is there a second? second. Great, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, Mr. Anessi. We will see you back on the 4th. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that closes agenda item number two. We will move now to agenda item number four, the final draft of the 2021 goals, where we will uh, discuss the draft that Jenny has prepared and vote on next year's goals. So Jenny, is there anything that you would like to say before, as we bring these up? No, not at this time. Thank okay, you. great. So I'll go through the roll again um, so that if there are any questions um, or any amendments that any of the board members would like to propose, we can discuss those at this time. So we'll start with Ken. No, I have no, uh, no questions or any comments. Thank you. David? Uh, one or two questions or comments. Uh, the first question I had is um, at our, when we were discussing this uh, a couple weeks ago, um, I guess I, I became a little confused in light of Barbara Thornton's comments as to whether we were considering um, drafting our own uh, accessory dwelling unit proposal versus versus you know working potentially with with publicly introduced proposals like like the one that she proposed at the last uh, special town meeting. Uh, so I I don't know whether we need to clarify that here, and I, I wasn't sure what our intention was. So I, I can, sorry, go ahead. Jen. No, go ahead, Rachel. So I was just going to say that uh, at the last meeting, we, we noted that we were going to revisit that on the January 4th meeting together, both um, have Barbara attend with what she had previously drafted along with any changes or amendments that she would like to make to her previously submitted um, uh, article and the article that had been drafted, taking into account the comments from the board during the com uh, public comment period uh, that Aaron had, had drafted. So um, it, the, what, where we had left it was that was something that we would work out together on the, on the fourth at that meeting. Okay, that makes sense to me. Jenny, I don't um, know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Nope. That was it. Um, I thought I had another question or comment, but I can't find it at the moment. So why don't you move on? Thank you. Jean? 
Thank you. Um, my only comment, this is not to suggest any particular changes to the goals, but just so we don't forget that we're also going to be bringing forward a number of corrections and non-substantive administrative changes um, to town meetings. So, you know, it doesn't have to be in the goals because they're not really substantive, but I just don't want those to fall off the radar screen. Those are those are noted, and um, they will not follow up fall off the, the radar screen. They are also um, part of the, the planning department's uh, goals as well. Jenny, is that correct? Yeah, just that those were already filed for this year's town meeting in 2020 annual town meeting. So we were planning to resubmit those for the 2021 with some updates maybe. with with the other notes that have come up. Yes, the administrative issues. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Jean? No, that's it. Great, thank you. Katie, did you have any uh, comments? No, no comments or questions. Okay, great. Uh, so do we hear, it, Jenny, did you have anything else before we take a motion to vote to um, adopt these 2021 goals? I don't have anything further to add. Thank okay, you. great. Do we hear a motion to uh, adopt the 2021 goals as submitted? So motioned. Uh, do we have a second? Second. I will take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am yes as well. All right, the 2021 goals have been adopted by the board. Let's see the time, great. Uh, so the next item is uh, a review of the uh, draft redevelopment board rules and regulations amendment. So we will review this draft and then it will be posted for public comment in a future and a hearing at a future redevelopment board meeting. Um, so as Jenny pulls this up, I will again go through a roll call to see if there are any comments or questions from the board. We'll start with Ken. No. Uh, David? My only comment is I, I still find it a little um, confusing to, to parse through the timing, uh, particularly where one or two of these, um, uh, one or two of the items in the, uh, in the chart of deadlines reference uh, other deadlines in the chart um, rather than, than a specific day or number of hours um, prior to the meeting. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any way to further clarify this because uh, we seem to introduce different confusion when we try to clarify it. Um, but it's not, to my reading, it's not perfectly straightforward. So Jenny, I'll, I'll ask you to address the consistency with the way that this is discussed in, in other uh, town bylaw documents. Um, well, just David, your question, I totally understand it. The way that I initially, the, the way that this was first drafted was around Monday night meetings but we clearly meet on more than Monday nights. Uh, sometimes you meet on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, especially during yeah. town meeting. And so it becomes very challenging to just glom on to one particular day of the week. So the, uh, and then the, the so that's one, the, the 48 hours piece is directly from open meeting law with, and that's like a portion of the clause that relates to the open meeting law at that particular section. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not really, you know, I don't think, these are these are deadlines that I think are uh, slightly softer than than this one. I mean, this is a hard deadline that we we have to make prior to a meeting um, in order to post a meeting. Um, the other ones, I mean, if you if there's some other way of clarifying things or you have a suggestion, I'm open to that. I just uh, I deleted the day just simply because I didn't think that worked since we yeah, meet I, all over I, the place. I, I take your point with respect to the fact that we meet on on uh, all different days, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, I, I don't 
in light of that, I, I don't really have a better suggestion. I think it is parse it, it if you do take the time to kind of work through it and pay attention to how uh, the different items relate to each other, you can figure it out. Um, so the information's there. Uh, I I don't have a better suggestion. Thanks, David. Do you have anything else? Nope. Okay. Uh, Katie. Um, I don't have any additional questions. Okay. And uh, Jean? Yeah, I think it's fine the way it's set up. I'll, I'll, and, I, and in part because it conforms to the way we've all been doing business for a while. So it's not really cutting back on timing anywhere. It's just re-describing it a little bit. I do, however, have one concern and it relates to what um, Jenny brought up. This works really well when our meetings are on Mondays because it basically means that we get the materials on Thursday evening for a Monday evening meeting because you don't count you know, Saturday and Sunday. My concern with the 48 hours is if we have a meeting on a Wednesday or a Thursday, not that we have them very often, but it could happen, then we will only have a couple days to review what could be a lot of material. I don't know how to deal with that specifically because I say this works really well for our Monday meetings or a Tuesday meeting if Monday was a legal holiday. It does raise concerns to me if we're meeting on another day of the week because then I think it might meet the letter of the open meetings law, but it really makes it difficult, I think, for us to do the amount of work that we have to do to prepare. Yeah, no, I, I definitely understand that. And definitely during town meeting season in particular, Erin and I often struggle to <laughs> figure out the right way to post all the meetings, especially when they're successive meetings. It's very, it's very challenging. It's also challenging when you've made, you're having a Monday meeting and a Wednesday meeting, um, which sometimes happens. Um, the only thing I can think of to address your point is maybe some sort of clause that, you know, when uh, should time, you know, be, uh, you know, additional time be uh, possible, the department will work to post materials as early as possible, you know, prior to a forthcoming meeting. I mean, I, I just don't know exactly how to address, you're talking about something very specific. Right. So yeah, maybe we'd say when, when a meeting is not on Monday, you know, the town will endeavor to post with more than 48 hours notice when possible, something like that. I think that's fine. Great. Did you have any other comments, no, Gene? That was it. Okay, great. Oh, so, I do. Have, yeah, I'm sorry. I have one other comment. Please. It doesn't relate to these changes, but it relates to something that I meant to mention earlier. If you go right up to the top, where it talks about our having adopted them on August 6th, which is great, but we then adopted one other section later, and now we'll adopt others. So, just my suggestion that when we adopt these changes, that the paragraph on the page about when they were adopted be amended to indicate both that we adopted um, rule, wait a second, the rule of rule 19 or whatever date we did. And then when we adopt these that we adopted those changes. So I think that's a just good way to keep a chronological track in the document. Okay. Great, thank you, Jean. So we will not be voting on these uh, this evening. They will be posted um, for the, the final draft with the changes that, that Jean suggested this evening will be posted uh, for public comment and a hearing at a future ARB meeting. Um, I'm assuming either the 4th or the 25th once we look at the agenda. Oh, it'll be the 25th. 25th, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Rachel, can I make one comment? Please. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Jenny and Aaron for the watermarks. 
on the last one. That that was quite helpful. Agreed. Very, oh, very clear. Thank you. Turned out to be a very easy thing to do. <laughs> nice when that happens. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Uh, and look at that. We're right on time. This never happens. Congratulate yourselves. Uh, we are at agenda item number six, which is the public forum on the economic analysis of the industrial zoning districts. So um, before we turn this over to, I believe, Aaron, who will be uh, introducing the, the speaker here, uh, for the board, I just wanted to note the process that I, I thought we could go through here in terms of after the presentation is, uh, is shared with us. Um, I thought was that we would open this up for public uh, comment first, given that it's a public forum and we really would like to hear from as many members of the public as possible. Um, and then I'll open it up to the, the board for roll call comments and, and questions, um, unless there are any objections from the board members. Okay, Erin, I will turn this over to you. Thank you. Erin, um, do you want me to start the presentation first or later? Um, no, you can start it. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I have a short introduction um, for the presentation. Um, uh, great, um, Jenny, so I'll just say next slide when I'm ready to switch the slide and um, I'll direct Eric and Emily to do the same. Um, so thank you for joining the Redevelopment Board's meeting tonight to hear a presentation on the economic analysis of industrial zoning districts. I am Erin Zwerko, Assistant Director for Planning and Community Development. Joining me tonight is Eric Halverson of RKG Associates and Emily Innes of Harriman. Before I turn the presentation over to Eric and Emily, I wanted to share some background on this project. Uh, next slide, Jenny. Great. Uh, the purpose of this project is to, to position Arlington to attract new businesses and jobs in emerging growth industries to locate to the industrial zoning districts in Arlington. In addition, uh, the project's goal is to create opportunities through which Arlington could realize increased revenue through strategic amendments to the zoning bylaw and potentially the zoning map. Next slide. The department, uh, oh, project background is fine. Thank you. Um, the Department of Planning and Community Development released an RFP just over a year ago for this project and selected RKG Associates of Harriman to perform the work. We kicked off this project last December with the Zoning by Bylaw Working Group, the members of which you can see on the slide, and joining us tonight are a few of them. Um, I see Charlie, John, um, Ralph, and I believe I saw Christian join us as well. Um, I apologize if I missed one of the other members. Um, throughout 2020, the economic analysis was completed which resulted in zoning recommendations. We released a video presentation and survey in mid 2020 to receive feedback on the recommendations um, to which we received over a hundred responses. Later in 2020, based on the feedback received and further conversations with the zoning bylaw working group, zoning amendments were prepared. Uh, so next slide, Jenny. Tonight's presentation is the culmination of the work completed over the last year, as you can see on the slide presenting the timeline to date. Um, lastly, I just wanted to note that this meeting is being recorded by ACMI and the full meeting, including this presentation, will be available via ACMI. With that, I will now turn it over to Eric and Emily for the bulk of the presentation. 
Great. Um, thanks, Aaron. I'm just going to um, spend a few quick minutes uh, just revisiting, reminding uh, regarding some of the key findings that we discussed the last time that we were together um, pertaining to the industrial districts uh, and just some of our market findings, uh, which I think will be a good segue again into Emily's discussion on the zoning and then also a segue um, back to me toward the end to talk about some of the financial feasibility analyses that um, ArcAG performed uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just as a quick reminder, um, this map shows the location of the five different industrial zoning districts in Arlington, which um, I'm sure as you all know by now are primarily located along uh, Mass Ave and the Minuteman Bikeway. Um, and from going from west to east, we typically have been referring to them um, as the Park Avenue District, the uh, Forest Street District, the Dudley Street District, Mill Street, District and Mystic Street um, District. And when we come back around both, I think to Emily's part, uh, as well as mine at the end, uh, we'll be referring back to those districts one more time. Um, and as you can see, the industrial areas are, are they're really interesting and, and they're surrounded by a pretty wide range of other zoning districts and uses, um, including both businesses and residential uses. Um, it really makes these industrial districts unique from our perspective. Um, in their land use composition as, as well as their sort of built form and character. Next, please. Um, as we discussed the last time, um, we conducted a market analysis that basically tried to place Arlington in the context of, of the larger uh, Middlesex County region to try to understand what kind of demand potential there might be over um, the next 10 years for commercial and industrial space. and. Um, one way in which we sought to answer that question was by taking employment projections for uh, Middlesex County over the next 10 years. And we applied what we call a fair share approach um, to see how much space might be needed if Arlington continued to grab about 1% of all the job growth in Middlesex County, which is about what uh, the town has been achieving over the last, over the last five to 10 years. Um, by this measure, there could be enough job growth in Arlington to sustain somewhere around 200,000 additional square feet um, over that 10 year period or about 20,000 square feet annually. Um, some of this, it's important to note, could be absorbed by existing vacancies um, or even additions to existing buildings. It doesn't necessarily always mean brand new built space, although it could. Um, much of that future growth is projected um, to be in industry sectors such as research and development, um, higher education, computers and tech, uh, tech sciences, C-suite management of companies, those kinds of things. Um, and these are very different than what Arlington's employment base looks like today, at least as it pertains to the industrial districts. Next. Um, as we talked about last time, housing prices for both owner-occupied housing as well as rental housing continue to rise in Arlington, uh, much like the rest of the immediate Boston region. Um, Arlington's median home value has increased over $300,000 um, since 2008. Um, people really want to live in Arlington. Um, I know right now with the pandemic, trends are shifting a little bit, but um, you know the, the suburbs, and I, I know Arlington is close to Boston and Cambridge and, and Somerville, but I think it still has the, the residential feel that people are looking for. Um, and, you know, people are moving out of the city to places more often like Arlington. So we think that that supply and demand equilibrium um, is really important to note. And it's sort of, and it's driving up the cost of housing. It's driving up the cost of land. Uh, and it's also driving up the cost of construction in general uh, in this region. Next, please. Um, the same is true when we look at the multifamily rental side. The median monthly rent in 2019 in Arlington was just under $2,500 a month. Um, while rents here are lower than almost all the adjacent communities, it's still really high compared to median household incomes in the area. Um, the increasing housing prices and the changing income dynamics really in all of these communities are driving factors um, when investors are looking for particularly in commercial and industrial districts are, are looking for uh, cheaper land. Um, and that's something that we'll also come back to at the end of the presentation. Uh, next, please. So just really quickly before um, I turn it over to Emily, a couple of key takeaways that helped us inform the zoning recommendations. Um, those include the, the existing industrial districts are very diverse in their businesses and their employment mix. And most of the jobs actually pay relatively well um, that are found in the districts today. 
At the same time, um, firms in these legacy industrial sectors in Arlington still struggle to justify the higher rents. And if they have to move out or they're displaced from the district, um, they will likely need to relocate much farther out in the region. Um, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to find either cheap land or cheap space until you, you know, you sort of drive till you qualify sort of thing. Um, so you'll they'll be continually going further and further out, um, which pushes that employment further out or means that folks who hold those jobs locally might have to drive further. Um, high tech and biotech um, might view Arlington as desirable in the future, um, and it's also less expensive than some of the other surrounding places like Somerville, Boston, Cambridge, even Watertown now, um, but it's still further from the Cambridge Boston hub. Um, so recruitment could be a challenge from an employment standpoint. Uh, and lastly, the pressure um, from the housing market will continue, um, I think, until a better balance can be achieved across the entire region, um, you know, not just in Arlington. Um, but across the whole region. And this is something um, to consider, uh, I think, as we discuss the zoning. Emily? Thank you, Eric. So as we started to figure out how we were going to put uh, zoning regulations together, we wanted to keep our eyes on uh, certain goals. And, and Aaron's talked about some of them already. But first of all, how do we keep industrial and commercial in this area? We did not want to lose that. We didn't want to lose the job creation, the economic development that both of those bring. Um, and then also, how do we respond to the fact that uh, housing um, has a higher value and that the land value uh, is um, so high in this area. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways we address that in the zoning. Next slide, please. So one thing um, that really came forward in our discussions with the zoning working group, uh, what we heard from members of the public was this idea about um, having certain development standards um, and uh, in particular, making sure those development standards were tied to community goals for this area and for the town in general. So uh, we knew about the net zero um, uh, initiatives. Um, the idea, because the um, industrial area is really interspersed among the residential areas, the idea of making it a walkable, pedestrian friendly, safe area, all of which are things that you don't normally think about in terms of industrial development. Um, and then thinking about uh, the location of most of these near the Minuteman bikeway, near Mass Ave. Um, and can we reduce the amount of parking and encourage public transit, walking, biking in order to get there? So all of these kind of went into the mix in terms of thinking about the zoning. And then we had to parse out what works with what, um, what is appropriate to request at which stage of, uh, or which type of development, or which stage of the process. So as we thought, talked about development standards, we've talked about you know what is appropriate for a building that's being built versus renovated, uh, what is something that a developer would do versus something that might be the responsibility of the tenant, um, thinking about how the standard could actually be enforced and not just at implementation, but over time. And were we asking for things that had a temporary impact or a permanent impact? And, uh, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more with Eric at the end, the relationship of the cost of the benefit to the benefit to the community and um, the relationship of what a developer might get in terms of a development standard versus the public impact of that. So we looked at, again, what happens at when you actually start to build and then what happens in terms of creating a bonus for something a little bit extra, something that the market not, might not otherwise uh, be willing to provide. And where we divided this was that everybody who meets a certain threshold must provide those pedestrian amenities and I'll walk through them, um, those that contribute to uh, a safe, attractive um, uh, environment for pedestrians and bicyclists. But when you got to something like a height bonus, that's where we required more. And so that really got linked to values around sustainability and goals for the net zero energy. And then finally for parking standards, I mentioned before this idea of encouraging public transit or multimodal transit, non-vehicular non transit, it. But also, how do you take an area of asphalt and consider um, heat island effect and reducing that impact and uh, critical because um, the industrial area is near to uh, Brooks is how do you reduce or eliminate stormwater runoff into surface water quality. So next slide, please. 
So as we started to think about the basic development standards, one is that buildings must be solar ready. And this is actually a response to something that we heard uh, during the public comment process on the first round. Um, that yards, uh, we reduce the amount that they were away from the front lot line and the idea is that you want the buildings to have a presence and find the sidewalk and the public realm, but uh, people called into um, uh, question the earlier lot line where uh, they said, look, we don't want the buildings too close. We want the ability to expand the sidewalks given the, the current pandemic and more people are out on the street and people starting to think a little bit more about how that pedestrian realm works. Um, also for the pedestrian realm, wanting transparencies uh, of the ground floor windows so that you could see activity, that the facades all had equal treatment so you didn't have one nice principal facade and everything else um, uh, looking blank and unfriendly. And then making sure little things, but uh, you see sometimes where development only goes so far and then there's a gap before the next sidewalk. So making sure that the public sidewalk and the front entry are actually connecting, thinking about dark sky friendly lighting, but that's still appropriate for pedestrian. So next slide, please. So you start to see um, how the standards work. And one of the key uh, things to this zoning is uh, thinking about the uh, setting up choices so the developers aren't locked into um, requirements that they can't meet. And this is critical, um, as you'll see from some of the work that Eric did uh, when you're thinking about what resources developers have for doing the pedestrian amenities and also can considering that some of these projects are likely to be larger than others. Um, so we didn't want to make this, this level prohibitive for a developer to comply with. So you can see that a, pedest uh, a developer can choose between shade street trees or plantings, and then they can uh, choose public art or um, seating or uh, store integrated stormwater and public art. Next slide, please. But for the proposed height, uh, we wanted to make it a little bit more stringent. And this is when we start talking about the net zero, about creating energy efficiencies in the buildings, but thinking in terms of what is a capital expense, what is uh, something that can be done at the time of development and not necessarily something that's going to be done by the tenant afterwards. So something that's related to the operating efficiency of the building that's more on the tenant. So it really came down to the idea of what can be done on the roof um, and as you'll, uh, or what can be done in the parking uh, when we think of the highly reflective surfaces. So they get to choose something on the roof, whether it's the vegetated landscape, the solar power, a blue roof, but they also have to do full on-site stormwater management. So we're addressing energy efficiency, but we're also addressing water quality um, and sewer system um, resiliency at the same time. Next slide, please. And then finally, for the parking standards, um, the idea that the standards are, we're trying to reduce the amount of asphalt. Uh, so pervious surfaces, if they go above the parking requirement, highly reflective surfaces to address the heat island impact, shade trees, um, and encouraging but not requiring, again, because of that trade-off between cost and implementation, rain gardens, electric vehicle charging stations. We also reduce the number of parking spaces required for cars and increase the number of parking spaces required for bikes. Next slide, please. And then after we met with you um, and heard some other public comments, uh, we had met with the working group, we changed some of the zoning that you had seen earlier. So we've added self-service storage facility to the mix of industrial and commercial uses that are there. We moved the standards by use to a new section, which we had talked about. We kept them grouped in the original draft so you could see which uses were getting standard, but then move them to the, a more appropriate place. Um, we'd had some questions about screening along the Minuteman bikeway and uh, standards for solar read readiness, um, accessibility, lighting, pedestrians. We've clarified those. Those were fairly minor tweaks. Um, now, there was a question that came up about mixed use, and it was interesting listening to your conversation earlier tonight. So we did um, actually change the standard on residential uses, so it was a little bit more clear. So. 
residential can be a component of a mixed use development. It is not allowed in our in the proposed zoning that you have in front of you. It's not allowed as a stand use, alone use, but it can be uh, part of a mixed use development. It can be either vertical, which means it's stacked on top of a uh, building, or it can be horizontal. In other words, you may have multiple buildings on one site your principal building or your principal ground floor use must always be either industrial or commercial. So you cannot have residential on the ground floor of a principal use. And then we wanted to limit the residential. So you couldn't come in with a 500 square foot cafe um, and then have, you know, far more units than were originally proposed. So residential use uh, at the time we had limited it to 50% of the industrial use on the space. Um, we found that was too limiting when we started uh, working with it. So the current proposal is that it is twice the um, square footage of the ground floor area of the principal industrial use. So um, it gets a little bit more flexibility. Uh, the way we had it before, you could only have one story of residential on top of a, uh, say their full ground floor was industrial. You could only have one story of residential. This now allows two stories of residential above the industrial use, but um, uh, it is still limited by the amount of that industrial use. And this goes back to this idea that we're trying to preserve the industrial capacity and the commercial capacity of this area. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Eric to talk about some of the um, pro forma analyses that he did uh, based on this new zoning um, and uh, the implications that we saw as we were going through these options. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so one question that arose during um, one of our recent zoning bylaw working group meetings was around whether development in the industrial districts would be able to provide enough financial return um, to, to essentially interest the private sector. Um, and then on top of that, this question of would the mitigation requirements that Emily was just describing um, in the proposed zoning add too many financial layers or, or potential barriers um, on top of what may already be challenging development conditions in these districts. Um, so to answer this question, we constructed a, a basic development pro forma model um, using data from a combination of sources, including um, our market study for um, this project, um, some of our own uh, research, and then inputs from um, other projects in nearby communities. Uh, for the pro forma analysis, we ended up testing four different development scenarios um, based largely on the work that um, Emily and her team did earlier in this study um, around the build outs and test fits for different parcels in each of the industrial districts. Um, we, we ended up using those test fits as case studies for the pro formas. Um, and then these scenarios included um, a couple of things. So the first one that we'll go over is um, what would happen if you took an industry, existing industrial building and you added up to two stories um, of office above. The second scenario is actually clearing, clearing a site or multiple sites and then constructing new industrial space um, basically from scratch. The third would be tearing down and clearing a site or multiple sites together and then constructing new industrial and commercial mixed use. So industrial on the first floor and likely office space on the two stories above. And then the fourth scenario is um, clearing the site and building um, new mixed use industrial residential as Emily was just describing. Next slide, please. So the first site that we tested was in the Mystic Street area. Um, and we took the Tetra Genetics building, if you're familiar with that, it's a, a one story brick building right on Mystic Street um, as our hypothetical. And I just wanna stress this um, these are purely hypothetical, each of these scenarios. Uh, we, there's, no, there's no plans or anything, at least not that we know of, but we just needed to be able to test um, the development pro forma on a couple of sites to try to um, bring some, some reality to the scenarios. And um, a couple of these, not this one, but a couple of the other ones match, as I mentioned, with what um, Emily and her team did from the, from the build out. So um, these are just hypotheticals for our um, own analysis. Um, so we looked at this site and said, what would it look like financially if the current owner um, of the site and, and building added two stories of office over the existing first floor of um, residential? Um, and then, so you go to the next slide, please. Um, we compared each of the scenarios to a, a general financial return of about 10%, 10% return on investment, um, which is fairly typical um, in this area uh, for different developments and what you might expect. 
So under this scenario, um, you know, we feel it's plausible that an owner might actually um, construct or want to construct two additional stories of office space um, if they were needed. Um, and if they were to do that, we do believe that the return on that investment would exceed the 10% um, IRR return threshold that we've established. Um, there's about a $200,000 um, sort of increase in added value, which we feel could potentially be used to cover some of the mitigation measures um, that Emily was referring to earlier. Um, but I do want to know in the scenario that that $200,000 is sort of on the margin or the IRR return is kind of on the margin. You know, if construction costs went up a little bit, if, if different things changed throughout the development program, it could then um, impact uh, that added value. So I would say given the mitigation, the potential mitigation as well as the returns, this is sort of on the margin, but it is plausible that, um, that someone would do this. The biggest caveat that I offer here is that this project assumes that there are no land costs and no acquisition costs. Um, we assume that the current owner is the one who would be taking on this project and not necessarily doing it for investment or resale reasons like we'll talk about and show in the other three scenarios. Um, at the bottom of the chart on the right, we also added what the potential net fiscal impact of that new development scenario or the development scenario is. In this case, it's just shy of about $75,000 in total um, net tax revenue um, to the town from this, um, from this scenario. Next. So the second um, scenario it, we, that we tested is using two parcels in the Far Street industrial area along Ryder Street. Um, for this scenario, we considered um, removing all the buildings on the site, clearing the parcels, and rebuilding as just new industrial space on its own. Um, we do acknowledge one of these parcels is currently town-owned, um, but we use the market value um, of both the properties to estimate the land value um, and, and test this scenario. Um, next slide, please. So here, based on the, the build-out um, Emily performed earlier, we estimated a, a single-story industrial building of about 26,000 square feet. Um, and we also um, estimated top-of-market rent um, for flex or sort of R&D or you know, sort of a, a more creative use than the straight industrial. Um, the straight industrial rents are pretty low. They're in like the seven to nine dollar per square foot range. Um, the sort of R&D flex space rents are closer to 15 uh, in this market. So to be a little more aggressive with our scenarios and see what was possible, we took the top, the, the sort of upper end of the rent threshold. Um, but even still under this scenario, it's highly unlikely that someone would purchase these parcels, clear them and then construct new industrial development. The return on investment is very low, uh, leaving us with a potential financial gap of almost two and a half million dollars. The biggest driver of the negative return here, sort of circling this, bring this whole conversation back around again, is the land value um, and the construction cost in combination. The rents really don't justify the land cost and the construction cost. Um, the only exception that I would offer to this might be if someone was purchasing and redeveloping the property for their own use, their own business, their own company, um, and, and didn't care as much about turning around and selling the assets, say after five or 10 years, um, as a as someone who is investing uh, in this and looking for a return might, um, you know, they would be at this site for the long haul and they would likely just pay that debt down over time, probably over 20 or 30 years, um, you know, as long as their business was successful and continue to operate in Arlington. Um, so under this scenario, the, the fiscal impact, if, if the scenario were to play out and it was to be constructed, um, uh, the fiscal impact of this development would be estimated at somewhere around $65,000 uh, in tax revenue per year. Next. The third scenario is centered on the Dudley Street uh, industrial area. Um, and we focused this scenario on the five or six parcels at the corner of Dudley Street um, and Grove Street. Um, this scenario looks at clearing those sites and constructing uh, a new commercial industrial mixed use building with again, industrial on the first floor and two stories of, um, of likely office space above. Um, you can go to the next slide. And for this scenario, we um, estimated based on the build out of just shy of um, 20,000 square feet of that flex industrial space on the first floor and about 34,000 square feet of office split um, on, the two, on the two floors above. Um, for this scenario, similar to what we described in the last one, it doesn't um, provide the, the returns necessary, I think, to encourage the reinvestment of this. Um, although it does perform better than the, the industrial only scenario, um, mostly because we're talking about um, a more intensely developed site, plus 
the uh, office rents are quite a bit higher um, than the industrial rent. So that helps the, the pro forma. Um, again, here, the primary driver of um, the lower returns is the land cost. Um, to assemble these five or six parcels, the land cost is close to $5.3 million. Um, and all of these, you know, mostly because all these parcels have active buildings on them, plus the land values in Arlington, uh, as we mentioned before, are quite high. Construction costs also play a role in this too, as the cost to construct office space is, is quite a bit higher than just your sort of standard industrial space. If the land costs were happened to be cut in half, um, this project would probably work financially. Um, we tested that in the pro forma. Um, so, so that land value really is one of the key, the key drivers of whether a scenario is going to work um, or, it's, or it's not. Um, so it was kind of interesting. Um, and under this scenario, the fiscal impact of the development is estimated at about $210,000 per year. The impact here is a lot higher because the assessed value of the land and those new buildings ends up driving a higher overall tax bill um, with, with minimal town service costs, given that this is an industrial and commercial scenario. Next. Um, the final scenario looks at the two large parcels in the Park Avenue Industrial District, uh, where the Gold's Gym uh, re currently resides, um, those buildings over there. Um, we use this site to test a mixed use scenario with one story of industrial flex on the first floor. And then we limited in this case to one story um, of residential above. Um, and as Emily mentioned before, um, we were sort of playing with, is it 50%? Uh, of the first floor for residential or is it more? Um, in this case, we just kept it uh, at 50% given the overall size of the, of the building. Um, this, and uh, you could go to the next slide, please. Um, this scenario is likely to perform um, well above market expectations. Um, and the primary driver here is the really high achievable rents compared to the overall land cost and the construction cost for the project. So here we almost see the opposite because the uh, residential rents in Arlington and, and throughout, as we mentioned before, throughout much of the region is, is quite high and it'll likely carry um, the cost of this project. And then the interesting thing is it will likely also carry additional mitigation measures as pr proposed in the zoning. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's worth noting that also that the residential rent uh, prices that we assumed in our model, we actually lowered them a bit um, from what the market rate rents are for other similar projects, say at like Br uh, Brigham Square, for example. And we lowered the rents a little bit because honestly, we weren't sure if residential over industrial flex space would be des you know, as desirable um, as if you were putting it, say, over retail, or if you're putting it over office, or if you were um, just building uh, uh, just a completely uh, residential development uh, like Brigham Square, for example. Um, so even though we did lower uh, the achievable rents a little bit, um, this, this still uh, appears to work uh, quite well. Uh, under this scenario, the fiscal impact of this development is estimated at um, just shy of $88,000 uh, per year. So um, in summary, we think it could be feasible for an existing owner to add on to their building and still create that return um, on their investment um, over time. And we also think that the mixed use residential scenario uh, would also likely provide positive returns. The other two scenarios um, will be more challenging, um, as I mentioned before, mostly due to the achievable rents of industrial development, uh, coupled with the, the really high land costs um, in Arlington. And the fact that in most of these districts, the parcels are relatively small, the, building, the existing buildings are all relatively small. So in order to Sort of make it worth your while you're going to likely have to purchase multiple properties together and aggregate those in order to get enough uh, development intensity to make the project work right. and then um, just in terms of next steps i think it's just the last slide uh, jenny yeah. Um, so we do have one final meeting um, with the zoning bylaw working group scheduled for um, January 6th. Um, and then I believe, um, Jenny, if you want to just talk quickly or Aaron about that last, the last bullet. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eric. And thank you, Emily, for the presentation um, there as, as um, you might have noticed um, on the goals for uh, for the 2021 um, year for the ARB and as discussed during um, the goal setting meeting on December 9th, we did talk about advancing this to um, the annual town meeting. Um, so that is 
that is why we decided to make this presentation at the Redevelopment Board um, so that uh, you all would receive the information as soon as possible. Of course, it is, um, it is up to the Redevelopment Board um, if, you, if you do plan to advance this forward. Um, but with that, um, thank you, uh, Rachel, for the time this evening and thanks to the Redevelopment Board members. Um, sorry, I was totally remiss at naming David as one of our zoning bylaw working group members. And I, I do believe a couple more had joined. So I really appreciate the, um, the uh, participation from those members. Um, but at this time, Rachel, um, I will turn it back to you um, or let me know if you'd like me to handle the Q&A um, at this point. Uh, sure, Erin, if, um, if you did want to field the, the Q&A, since most of the questions will be coming to, to you and um, Eric and Emily, that would be absolutely fine to me. I'd be happy to, to hand that over to you. Great. Um, and uh, right before we launch into the Q&A, Jenny, do you have anything to add at this time? Okay. No, no nothing at this time. Thank you. Looking Thank forward to hearing from the people who are participating in the questions. Great. Um, so uh, we'll open it to some um, public comment. Um, I do see a couple people with their hands raised. Um, and uh, if you do, um, if any of the members of the public or the zoning bylaw working group members um, have comments, please feel free to use the raise hand feature. Um, and then, uh, so I'll just call on the order that I see in our, in the queue. Um, so John Warden, as a member of the zoning bylaw working group. Um. <clears throat> Uh, thank, thank you, Aaron, um, and members of the board. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, oh, yeah, John Worden, uh, 27 Jason Street. Um, uh, the zoning bylaw working group was going to have a meeting at nine o'clock in the evening on an early uh, Wednesday in December, but that was canceled. So the draft that's uh, presented in, in, uh, to, to the board uh, is you should understand this is not something that the zoning bylaw working group uh, has endorsed, approved, or voted on, or anything. Uh, we've been working on this project, the industrial project, um, for about a year now, and uh, it seemed kind of premature to lay it all in front of the redevelopment board when, when we, our work, and coming to a consensus on what it should contain has not been completed. I guess maybe we're going to do that on January 6th or putting the, uh, the, the cart before the horse. But um, <clears throat> the um, second uh, point I should like to make is that um, when this proposal for this appropriation for this um, uh, study uh, was before the town meeting to be taken out of CPA funds, I believe, uh, there was a lot of grumbling on the floor and people saying, well, you know, what, what do we need all these consultants for? Uh, is do we have a very fully staffed planning department? Why don't they do these studies? And, and, and there was a good deal of grumbling and people say, I'm going to vote against this. Then Mr. Tosti, the then chairman of the finance committee, uh, got up and gave a very strong speech encouraging town meeting to vote this. And the, the, the thrust of his speech was that the industrial and commercial uses in the town were those that produce taxes uh, as opposed to residential, which costs us net money. And he emphasized very strongly, no residential. We, we, th th this, I'm so glad we're gonna do this to deal with our industrial commercial uh, uses and not our residential uses. And, and on that basis, town meeting did vote the appropriation. And then, and I've reminded the committee of that, um, the working group that is, uh, uh, as we've gone along. And now, now we see this latest draft. Um, they put in, uh, they put in mixed use in this uh, re residential, and and we know what, we know how the redevelopment board treats mixed use. Uh, the, the the statement of Mr. Bunnell was, we're the redevelopment board. We can do whatever we want. And and I I would. I was I will strongly urge before the working group, and I will urge a town meeting that the mixed use and any residential references be totally deleted from this. If you want to have, live in the industrial zone, there are some houses, 
there are some apartment buildings there, fine. Uh, but to, to start allowing the industrial zones to be exploited by developers to build, as the gentleman just said, it's a lot more money to rent apartments than, than it is to provide commercial space. But we've got 95% of the town is devoted to, to residential zoning. Leave this little 5% alone and let it be commercial and residential. That's, that's what, that's, I mean, commercial, commercial and industrial. Um, that is what Mr. Tosti proposed. That is what persuaded town meeting to vote for this appropriation. And, and, and if the, if, if the, uh, the folks who are now talking about all this residential weren't going to do that, I think they had a moral obligation to stand up in town meeting and say, well, we're not going to, you vote, you vote us the money. We're, we're, we're going to do whatever the consultants say or whatever we think. We're, we're not going to be bound by any anti-residential uh, thoughts that you expressed, Mr. Tosti. That didn't happen. And I, I think, I, I think in fairness to, to the, the, the town meeting that were persuaded that this, this is the way to go, uh, that we, we have to, I'm sorry, we, 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 we have to, we have to not allow additional residential uh, uh, areas. We've already lost in the biggest one of these zones. We've already got the Myrex decided to plunk a huge 40B apartment building in the middle of that industrial zone. We've already lost all that territory because they've decided instead of coming to the town like their father, Mr. Myrak did, uh, John Myrak, uh, and ask for zoning change, they, they take the sleazy 40B route and cram it down our throats, whether we like it or not. And, and, and there's a big loss in, the, in that district. Uh, so we, 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 as Tosti said, we, we, we cannot afford more residential. It's costing us money. And, and there, there are bogus figures in here about the, about the cost of education, which Don Seltzer has presented to the working group and to the planning department. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I will point out that uh, residential uses um, currently exist in the industrial zoning districts. Um, and the mixed use, including residential, has been in the draft of the zoning since the earliest version from earlier this fall um, in September and October. Um, but I wanted to see if um, Eric wanted to add in a little bit of information about um, how the fiscal analysis um, was developed um, and why uh, we presented it tonight, at least uh, an example, including uh, residential uses. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so at the very beginning of the project and which was part um, of our charge with the scope of work, um, we were asked to develop a, a marginal fiscal impact model for the different use types that were under consideration, the commercial industrial, um, as well as different types of residential single family condos and apartments. Um, not that all those would be uh, you know, necessarily allowed or would be proposed at that time at the beginning of the project, but we wanted to try and cover all of our bases. Um, in working with each of the town departments, including uh, the school department, uh, we came up with our um, net fiscal impact um, figures either on a per unit basis for a residential um, or on a per square foot basis for industrial and commercial development. Um, and we thought it would just be useful for the scenarios this evening, those four scenarios, just to share with you all what the potential fiscal impacts would be, because I know it's very um, important and has been a point of conversation throughout um, this process. Uh, so far, and I'm sure it will be uh, continuing even after tonight. Um, I, I will say that um, residential um, does uh, create tax revenue for the town. I know that sounds counter to what you may hear, but um, working with the town's latest budget and accounting for revenue for each unit, as well as the expenditures that the town um, has to undertake to serve different types of development, um, most residential does come out um, quite positive uh, uh, from a tax perspective. And again, that's driven primarily by uh, the either the for sale values and the assessed values of for sale units, whether they be single family houses or condos, or the high, the high rent levels, um, which then end up driving high assessed values uh, for multifamily um, for multifamily units. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, so moving down the list, um, I have uh, Carl Wagner is next. Um, and keeping with the direction of the meeting, um, please, uh, so that we can hear from the uh, most amount of people, 
uh, keep your comments to about three minutes. Thank you, thank Carl. You. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Worko. Um, I was in town meeting and when this uh, um, $70,000 uh, study was approved, and I recall specifically the words of uh, Alan Tosti, uh, and I think everybody here should go back and take a look at that or uh, remember that we have a town that has about 5% industrial use uh, in the tax base and the rest is residential. That's much less than many of the towns around us. And that affects the, us in the residential areas. We have to pay more to fund the same police, fire and schools that other towns have to do. So I was pleased when this study was put forth and over the last two years, I have been less pleased to see that this study has been going away from the idea of adding more industrial use and getting more tax value out of that for the people who live here. It's been very frustrating, therefore, to see the RKG consultant present to us now that this study is no longer about improving and increasing industrial uses, which are the only ways we cut our taxes, uh, but now including one and two floor residential units and in a throwback to 2018, which we saw the planning department come out with a bonus, which means a way to get around the bylaws to make buildings bigger and they're going to have residential use. So. Uh, I'm not sure what was just said about how residential uses really help taxes. He's wrong when he says that. We all know that when you add a residential unit, the property tax value goes up and worse yet for anti-racist action and affordable housing, the average cost of living in Arlington goes up. So I ask you to go back and look at the first page of this report where you had two goals on the page. One of them was bringing new business and helping business. And the other one was something about bringing in revenue to the town. If you allow the mixed use to increase in the industrial zones, you will increase the tax burden of the people who already live here. You will hurt the town's finances. Do not do this. Go back and rewrite this plan so that it is only for the improvement of industrial tax base. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, Emily, do you want to speak to um, the way that the uh, bonus is formulated? Um, I, I think Eric has explained um, why, why we included residential. Um, so rather than continue on that point, um, Emily, do you wanna talk about the way that the, the, the zoning is based as an incentive to encourage industrial uses primarily to get that larger ceiling height needed? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things in there, Aaron, that I think they're important to um, think about. One is the fact that we are not, the zoning is designed so that residential is not going to supplant industrial. And by that, I mean that we are requiring that industrial be the ground floor use, the principal ground floor use. Because if you look at the vast majority of industrial buildings, they only have a single, single story. They only require that single story. You see very few industrial buildings go up to a second story unless they have some sort of office component with it. So the idea that we looked at is that the ground floor is reserved for uh, primarily industrial use, maybe some commercial, depending on whether or not the flex space is, is used in there. So residential should not supplant industrial. And that's a, that's a direct response to the desire of the community to have these job producing uh, industries there. So then when you have resident, when you have industrial as a ground floor, then what do you have above it? You can have office, you can have residential. So in order to do that, you need to go up to a higher story level. And this is where the bonus comes in um, is because industrial buildings used to be fairly low lying, but what we're seeing now as more uh, um, uh, distribution uses come in, as more, uh, different types of industrial happen, that the ceiling heights on the ground floor need to be a lot higher than older industrial buildings are. And so in order to get that second floor of office or that second floor of residential, or even a floor of industrial, a floor of office, a floor of residential, you need to have a higher height. But we did understand that the community was worried about having higher buildings near the residential. And so the idea of the bonus incentive is to give something back. If the um, uh, person developing the building comes forward and wants that higher height, they have to be able to give something back. And the most 
logical thing from what we were hearing is to tie that to the net zero, uh, which was a community value for sustainability and energy use. So they have to meet that higher standard of the sustainability and energy use in order to get the higher height. We did also put some um, restrictions on uh, the production of shadow in there. Uh, I understand there have been some questions about that as well, and it's certainly something that could be revised, but the idea was to minimize the impact on the residential, the residential abutters immediately around it from the increase in the height and to produce community value. And at the same time, use the floors above the industrial to help uh, create an, an incentive for that industrial use on the ground floor. Thanks, Emily. Um, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think uh, Emily hit uh, on almost all the points that I would have made, especially the one um, about us hearing loud and clear that we don't necessarily want to displace or supplant um, businesses, but uh, try to also encourage new development that may end up bringing additional businesses where there might be one today if we are, um, you know, adding additional uh, floors, say, of office space or maybe making the, the base floor a little bit bigger, there might then be room for additional um, you know, not only additional businesses, but also if there's a business that is there today that wants to expand and add more employees, you know, sort of adding to the employment base of the town. So we've, I think we've tried uh, in coordination with staff and the zoning bylaw working group to um, come up with, you know, different scenarios to try to make um, added investment over time in the industrial districts attractive um, by making um, these uh, changes to the zoning bylaw. Um, you know, one thing that that I always think about is if changes aren't necessarily made um, in Arlington or, or in other suburban communities similar to Arlington that have um, these older and, and they usually tend to be smaller industrial districts in terms of their overall size and parcelization, um, then things sort of stay the same and they don't necessarily change over time. Um, and that might be okay. Um, but if we are trying to encourage additional investment, um, you know, we've tried to do what we could um, on our end, uh, working with everyone together to figure out a way in which we could try to enable that. Thank you, Eric. Um, so the next person I have in the queue is Steve, also a member of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Steve Revelak. Ah, hello, Eric. Good evening. Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. And yeah, speaking as a member of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group, but not on behalf of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Uh, one is to just set, uh, the first, first remark I'd like to make is to just set some expectations uh, about what we might do with the industrial district changes should we adopt them. So about five and a half percent of Arlington zoned acreage allows commercial and industrial uses. And just by coincidence, those commercial industri and industrial uses generate about five and a half percent of our property tax revenue. Now, this study and these, what we're talking about here is just the industrial zone, which is about 1% of the total land acreage in Arlington. And by coincidence, it also generates about 1% of the tax revenue. So on a, just like on a tax top line, you know, way of looking at things, we're talking about a very, very skinny sliver of the pie. I mean, we can try to make it wider, but a little wider, but, you know, we're, you're, really talking about, you know, when it comes to revenue, we're really talking about changes to a 1% contributor. It's really small. Now, on the other hand, one, so one of the things that we might be able to, or that might come out of, um, you know, the, the industrial zoning amendments proposed are some, you know, some different types of businesses in Arlington. So I think there, there would be a decent shot at getting a brewery, which I, I think that'd be great. Um, you know, and also, you know, and having different kinds of, you know, forms of employment and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that I like about this proposal the most is that it does have, a, you know, at least, you know, something of a value statement behind it. So, and specifically, I'm talking about the bonus provisions where you know you if you would like an extra story you're going to have to do a high albedo roof a blue roof passive solar 50 or you know solar ready half the roof covered with solar you'll need to plant trees and add pedestrian amenities so the idea is you know you're taking things that um you know we believe the community wants 
and we believe the community do would benefit from them. And you know, we're essentially using it as a, as a bargaining chip. Um, I think that's a you know a reasonable way to you know get what you want. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, the proposal shapes up over in the coming months. And thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, I will note that um, related to breweries, um, other changes to, to um, Arlington's alcohol rules would, would um, might need to change to fully support the addition of breweries. Um, but it is, uh, it is something that can be done hand in hand with this or after um, should this zoning proceed um, and be adopted, something that could be handled afterwards. Um, so I just wanted to make that note um, that there, there is some intersectionality with other uh, rules and regulations um, relative to uh, additional uses in the town of Arlington. Um, Emily or Eric, do you have anything to add from uh, based on the comment that we received? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, the next person on the list, um, I apologize, you had uh, stated your name earlier, but it's the gentleman um, under Colleen Cunningham. Hi, Stuart Brorson. I am at uh, 73 Kensington Park, and Colleen is my wife, and she's here with me. Um, just two comments. Uh, one is, I like this idea a lot. The, you know, I think that it's great that we're considering sort of supporting bringing industrial and commercial uses into Arlington. And uh, if you look at the work bar, which is up there next to the, um, the new Schwamm Mill, the brick Schwamm Mill, um, that place is oversubscribed as far as I know. So there's evidently demand for, you know, office space. So that's a good thing. Um, I, I, followed the conversation about um, you know, costing out the different kinds of development scenarios. And it was very interesting to me that um, several of them failed based on the land cost issue. Um, and, and that says a lot, but the question then to be raised is, well, okay, you, 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 you calculated based on a land cost, but that land cost is based on the notion that um, a developer could put basically whatever the heck they want in that place. And therefore the land cost reflects um, the possibility of building residential. And, and so that's why the land cost is probably so high. So the question becomes, if you exclude the um, ability to build residential, the land cost will go down, what will it become and how will that affect the, um, the profitability calculations that you performed? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, I think this one is uh, in your camp. Yep. Yeah, no problem. Um, great question. Thank you very much for raising that. Um, so the way we calculated land costs today, we just assumed that the current assessed value, that's what we used as a proxy for land cost or acquisition. So whatever the land cost is um, in the current tax roll for FY 2020 uh, is what we assume. So right now, um, you, as Emily mentioned before, are limited in what you can do from a residential perspective under the existing zoning, not the proposed zoning. So this would be based on what you could do as of today under the zoning bylaw. Um, I would say that if the, the changed to then increase uh, the value that someone could derive from their property based on uh, different uses added or subtracted, uh, that could potentially change the value of that piece of property over time. It wouldn't be immediate, um, but you may see some catch up a couple of years um, down the line, depending on what changes are made. Yeah, so just, just this is Stuart again, just to follow up on that. Uh, thank you for the answer. So in a sense, the price that, you know, got cost or the cost that got priced into your analysis is uh, potentially based on what a developer might have assumed they could have gotten for the property, even though they're currently, um, you know, sort of limited to uh, commercial or industrial use. You know, it's, it's very clear that developers come to this board and then sort of find weasel ways in order to build residences instead of commercial or um, or industrial use. And so that's probably part of the reason why the land costs were so high. The other thing I wanted to offer is that taxation is usually used by governments as a way to help make these economic decisions. Um, so one could, for example, say, look, if you want to turn this into a residential development, we're going to, we're going to charge you a surplus tax, which will then you know, bring a benefit to the town because part of the reason we want residential or rather industrial is because we want a better tax base. It'll bring, you know, more taxes to the town and will also 
serve to sort of discourage the conversion to residential, which is really the whole point behind this study as I understand. Um, so just two things to think about the taxes and the potential that developers, you know, the, the, the things are priced based on what people think they can get as opposed to what they actually are worth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so next on the list is uh, Don Seltzer. Don? Thank you, Erin. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I've been following this project uh, since it began. I guess it was probably just about a year ago today or so uh, that the first presentation was made. And one of the things that really stood out for me, the best takeaway from that first presentation was this slide. 93% of Arlington's working residents have to commute out of town. Uh, there aren't a lot of good paying jobs in Arlington. Most of the jobs are low paying and they're actually filled by people who come from other towns where they can afford to live um, to fill them here. And wouldn't it be great if we could use our industrial districts to bring in high paying jobs. And that was one of the other takeaways from that, that presentation that industrial zones offer the potential for high paying jobs and something where Arlington residents could actually work in their town. They don't have to commute into Boston. They don't have to use the red line. They could walk or bike to their job. Now, as far, I watched the evolution of the recommendations and Back at the end of May, uh, the recommendations from um, RKG and Harriman were that mixed use in the industrial district shall not include residential uses. And it was further emphasized in their suggested table of uses. Again, mixed use shall not include residential uses. The project then sort of went into a quiet period. I think it was five months without any meetings before the zoning bylaw working group. Uh, there were no other presentations to other town committees as far as I know. It was simply a survey of residents um, in which they were given a choice of 11 possible uses for the industrial district. And last on the preference of that was housing. And among the comments section, they were grouped into nine um, groups of types of comments. And one of those was housing does not belong in the industrial district for a number of good reasons. It limits the kind of industry that can move in there because certain things are just incompatible with residential. And if you put residential in there, you're going to limit the possibilities of what businesses can locate there. So it was very surprising to me in October when suddenly um, in that presentation, this idea popped up of, well, we're gonna start allowing residential mixed use. Uh, it wasn't given in the main presentation. It's something that was buried down in a footnote of the table of uses. And it says that uh, mixed use could have up to 50% of the gross floor area. Now we learn for tonight's presentation that this has been upped. Now we could have residential use can be twice the gross floor area of the principal ground floor industrial use. And that means that residential, by our, our definitions, is now the principal use of that building. And this is simply an invitation for developers to follow the path of least cost, highest revenue, and build structures in which the ground floor is a very inexpensive commercial application, maybe just the storage facility, uh, even a parking garage, and the upper floors are residential. And that's what we're going to see happen in places like, take the Myrac track. Uh, that's 12 acres of the most developable industrial in our town. Two acres have already been taken over by 40B, you put in a law like this, a change like this, and you can bet that the rest of the Myrac property at 1195 and the adjacent properties are gonna be converted into essentially purely residential with some type of commercial um, on the ground floor. 
And that, that's what I foresee happening with it the way it is. Let's go back to the basic idea, which is, by the way, this, what this says here is completely inconsistent with what the master plan says. So I think we should abide by what the master plan's intentions are and not start introducing large scale residential into our industrial districts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emily, would you like to clarify um, the comment? Yeah, can I clarify just on the table of uses in particular, um, there, got, there was a lot of confusion over that May 1 and uh, that's because the, the proposed table of uses um, in the draft zoning had two columns in it. One was the existing zoning and one was their proposed changes. So you can see them side by side. Under the existing zoning, there was a footnote D that said that residential was prohibited from the, uh, from the area, which is true under the current zoning. There is then a footnote E for the second, the proposed that said we are going to allow it as part of the mixed use component. Uh, what I should have done was uh, I, I've left the footnote D in there so people could read it. What I should have done and what I did in the next draft was cross it out because there was so much confusion over the first one. So I admit it's a fine point, but um, the idea was that people would read column A, the existing zoning, see the footnote D. As you know, footnotes are very small, say, okay, in the existing zoning, it's prohibited. And then next to it, it had footnote E. Okay, in the new zoning, it's not prohibitive. Uh, it's not prohibited. Unfortunately, that got to be a mess of confusion, which we corrected in the next draft. And then I'm, I'm sorry people then uh, thought it was uh, introduced for the first time in the second draft, but it wasn't. It was actually just simply not clear in the footnotes. So I did want to clarify that. Thank you, Emily. Um, so next I have uh, Chris Loretti, um, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Aaron. Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adams Street. Um, first, I just want to make a few comments about the um, economic models that were presented. And I'm having a, a little bit of trouble um, swallowing them because I'm not sure they correctly considered the lot sizes and the floor area ratios and what could be built. <laughs> In the first case um, of the tetragenetic site, I don't think you could put two floors on that building because the lot's so small, you'd ex exceed the floor area ratio. On the second example for the Lalicata site, you could build way more than, um, in the adjacent land, you could build way more than was indicated. And then on the third site on Dudley Street, I think one of the reasons that lot is so valuable is that it already is residential. And it, the, the valuation is based on the fact that, you know, they can collect good rents from those, the apartments there. Or, or you know, if they're if they're condos, they're they're priced to account for that. Um, and I, I think what's going to happen, and I have to agree with Mr. Seltzer, is basically you're you're converting two thirds of the buildable potential of the industrial zone to residential. I mean, that's that's what it says. And you know, forget about all this talk about the footnotes. The the relevant text is in section 5.9.10, and it says two thirds of the building can be residential. As I read that, it doesn't even have to be in the same building because it says you can have mixed use in multiple buildings on the same site. And what you're comparing to is the principal use or the flurry of the, the flurry on the first floor of the principal building. So you could build houses um, and then have a single industrial use building as I read that. Um, and the other thing that I think is ridiculous is it says residential must, residential uses must be a component of the mixed use development. Well, currently you can have mixed uses and you can't have residential. So now you're saying you have to have residential as part of the mixed use. That makes no sense at all either. Um, so basically you're gonna be driving the cost up uh, and the cost of, you're, you're actually making it much more expensive to bring in industrial and commercial uses that are currently allowed by putting this residential component in there that, that's gonna drive the cost of the land. You're, you're raising the land price considerably. Um, final point is, I think you know the way to approach this is the way that was done in the economic development study that I think was done about 10 years ago when I was on the ARB, and I think RKG might have been the, the um, consultant for that as well, 
And one of the sites that was considered then was the Gold Gym site, and, and the proposal was to rezone it. And, you know, as Mr. Warden said, that I think is a more appropriate way to go about these changes. If you want to, um, one, introduce the residential component, but two, um, I think you also have to look at what the limitations are of the industrial zone. You know, you can't put large scale commercial in, um, in the industrial zone. And you may want that in a place like the Gold's Gym site, which is right next to, you know, one of the commercial districts, major commercial districts of the town. So I think um, I'm not 100 percent opposed to allowing some residential and more commercial uses or different commercial uses in the industrial zone. But I don't think trying to sneak it in as part of the mixed use is the way to go about it. I mean, we've seen we're seeing what's happened for mixed use um, in other parts of town where they're simply all residential. And, and even if it's only two thirds, it still takes away that other non-residential component and the potential for it going forward. So I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Um, Emily or Eric, um, which uh, there were a number of points made. Um, would either of you like to respond? Um, I'll also uh, see if Jenny has anything to add. I'll respond on a couple and then you guys can jump in and, and add. Um, I think the residential um, uh, being must be part of the mixed use development. I think that's, uh, I think I could clarify that uh, in the next round by saying residential can only be part of a mixed use development because the idea is not that you're required to have that residential, but that residential can only happen if it is part of a mix of uses. So um, I'm happy to make that change if uh, uh, that clarifies it. I think again, um, just remembering that we're, we're not, I think there, there's an assumption that by allowing twice the amount of industrial space that we're trying to push the industrial space out. The industrial space is likely to only ever take up the ground floor. So what we're really saying is you can have an industri industrial on that ground floor. And if you have that industrial, then you have basically the air rights of twice that square footage can be residential. You're still gonna be limited on parking, which is going to, to create a limitation of how much residential that you can develop there. You've mentioned F, uh, FAR, there's some other limitations in there that's going to drive down the size of the building and there's the height limitation. So yes, there's a bonus for height, but it's only going to take you up so far. And in fact, uh, depending on the type of industrial that you're doing, you may only be able to, you may not be able to have any more than two floors of residential. Again, if it's a, um, uh, and we, we did the multiple buildings on a site because we've seen that before in industrial areas, your principal use is that, that the largest building, the principal building has to be industrial or commercial and therefore the residential is going to be limited by how much that of that building exists. So it's not that it's a mandatory twice the amount, it is that is your ultimate limitation. So just to clarify that a little bit more. Eric and Jenny, I don't know if you have any points on the other pieces. Um, sure, just in terms of the site selection, th those are great points. Thank you for, for raising those. Um, just on the tetragenetic site, when I actually was thinking about that exact point when we were looking for a potential building and I, I wanted to use it more as a hypothetical. I, I think the point about the FAR and, and maybe more importantly, the parking the site is uh, quite constrained from a parking standpoint. Um, but I was thinking more from a, a hypothetical example, that's a business type and, and even a sort of building footprint where you could potentially see that scenario play out in existing building and existing business and somebody chooses to, to go vertical with it. Um, that was more the reason why I thought that was an interesting example. Um, and I, I agree with you about the Delby Street site. I do think that the land value there is driven by those by um, I think it's three sort of L-shaped residential buildings um, that are taking up some um, of, of that parcel area. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, if you were to cut uh, that land uh, cost about in half, um, maybe a little more or a little less than half, um, the project would likely pencil um, as that mixed use uh, industrial commercial uh, development. So land cost again does um, uh, play, into, play into that. Um, the reason why I chose that one was just to try to be synergistic with what um, Emily and her team did from a build out perspective in previous iterations as we were working with the, with the zoning bylaw working group. And Jenny, really quick. 
Yeah, just uh, really quickly, the, the Park Avenue lot that was mentioned um, and the questions that were raised about it, I will just also note that we've looked at that lot as part of the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan and there were other zoning proposals and suggestions that were made for that site. So we have been looking at and trying to understand what is economically viable in these areas. Uh, that's one thing I wanna note. The second thing I wanna note, which I've heard a few times is how this connects to the master plan. I think sort of that's the underlying message or question. And I wanted to say that back when we developed the RFQ for this whole proposal back in uh, 2019, last year, seems like a long time ago, um, we noted that, and I noted this to town meeting as well, the whole point of this project is because it's the impetus is from the master plan, which noted that today's industrial users have different needs now than in the past, including space needs and configuration as well as supporting business uses. The master plan recommended removing the minimum FAR requirements for certain uses, allowing restaurants, allowing smaller retail spaces, and promoting flexibility and redevelopment and allowing residential uses to be built in mixed use structures where the industrial commercial uses comprise the majority of the space. So that might be the only thing that is in question, but this, um, you know, the, the point of this project is to figure out what can we do with these spaces? What would spur some redevelopment or any development at all? And so if there are any changes that we do need to make or recommend making, of course, um, as part of that, I think that's that's what we're talking about here. We haven't, we're, we're, we're hearing some of the recommendations now, but there will be further time to discuss these things. This is not a final uh, proposal to the board by any means. So I, I definitely appreciate the questions, but I just wanna make sure it's also clear that it is part of the master plan to study the industrial areas and to make them realize their full potential, if you will, through any vehicle possible. Um, and I feel that that's what we've provided here. So I hope. I hope that there's, uh, I'd like to hear from the additional uh, people who have questions. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Jenny. Um, oops. Uh, so uh, Rachel, just a quick um, check with you. Um, there are three new comments and a, a second comment. Um, so I just wanna make sure it's, it's okay to continue um, getting the feedback from the, the public. Please do, I think it's very important that we, um, that everybody has a chance to speak at least once. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Len Diggins, um, select board member. And resident at 8 Windsor Street, East Arlington. This is exciting. You know, it, there's so many possibilities here. It, uh, and I'll channel uh, Mr. Burnell and say that we can do anything. We, we as a, a town can do anything. It, uh, we just have to decide on what we want to do uh, it, for me. It's like I, I could imagine I mean, that Gold's Gym, that Gold's Complex having a gym on bottom be a couple of floors of lab space. I mean, as someone who worked in a lab, I would then love to go to my apartment or whatever on top of it. We just have to build up. We have to zone up for it. But we have, as we as a town, have decided we want to do that. We could have a one seat bus ride. I mean, to to um, Kendall Square in Boston, if we could get the MBTA to sign on to that. Just some possibilities. But we're, really, my question, and this is perhaps to uh, the working group, is: Do we have a target for the amount of um, of um, growth in? industrial space that we want it uh it's because i think if we don't have a target for what we want it, it'll be hard to really get there we can still get there i mean but i find generally if you have a goal or a target for how much more industrial space or how much we want to raise from the industry um in terms of um revenue it, it'll be hard to get there so that's it thank you Thank you, Len. Um, Eric, real quick, do you want to talk about the analysis that you completed early on in this project about um, target uh, space, commercial and industrial space? Um, uh, yeah, be happy to. Um, I, I guess um, I just want to make sure that I answer the, the question properly, at least the way I, I understand the question. We didn't necessarily come come up with a target where the town said we would really like to increase our tax base by X percentage or shift the, the balance of residential and commercial by X percentage. Or, um, you know, we want to we want to be able to attract 500,000 square feet over the next five years. Um, so what we did just from an analytic standpoint was we just looked at how much um, 
how much how many jobs um, and thereby uh, estimated uh, commercial and industrial space the town has been able to attract over um, the last five to 10 years um, as a share of the county's uh, job growth. And then we projected that forward um, over the next 10 years, assuming that the town would continue to capture at least that share um, of the county's growth. And that resulted in that approximately 200,000 ish square feet over the next 10 years that the town could potentially uh, attract. So if we wanted to use that potentially as the, as the floor of the goal, um, I think that would be good. And then um, whatever's achieved above that would, would I think would be great. Um, it, it's just interesting also thinking about some of the, some of the shifts um, that are taking place too. I think we're starting to see um, some of the R and D biotech tech push sort of out of Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, um, where a lot of the development's been happening and, and it's starting to percolate its way into the suburbs. Um, right now, a lot of that is taking place in larger scale manufacturing facilities that are supporting pharmaceutical companies uh, as well as biotech. I'm not sure maybe outside of the Gold's Gym site that Arlington has a kind of big enough site to accommodate something like that without some pretty serious parcel aggregation. Um, to your point, what does the town want to encourage and what are the lofty goals to achieve? Um, you know, I would say it's not out of the realm of possibilities and something that the town could potentially shoot for. Um, but I see um, sort of Arlington's industrial districts being a little bit more smaller scale development, more incremental in nature, but I still see it being able to, you know, attract um, companies that are, that are operating in that space, uh, if that makes any sense. It does, and thank you very much. Thank you, Len. Um, next up is Christian Klein. Hi, Christian Klein, um, resident of Newport Street, also on the, uh, the working group. Um, I just had a couple quick questions in regards to the, that paragraph 5910, um, then a more general question. Um, so the last line of residential use must be no more than twice the gross floor area of the principal ground floor industrial use. Just want to confirm that you could still do residential over commercial. It doesn't, you don't have to have industrial. It could be industrial or commercial on the first floor. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think an earlier draft had just industrial and we were shifting it to industrial and commercial. Okay. And then where it just talks about twice the gross floor area of the principal ground floor use. Um, just wanted to see, is that the, would that be twice the ground floor level of the building or just the portion of it that's devoted to the industrial or commercial use? Um, obviously, if it's a mixed use development that includes residentials, a portion of the first floor is gonna have to be devoted to the residential use as well. And I just wanted to clarify how that was gonna be treated. It's the, um, uh, sorry, Aaron, to jump in, but it's the commercial and industrial use. So in other words, say you have a 2000 square foot lobby mail thing on the ground floor for your residential and entry, you don't get to count that in terms of creating your residential use above. It's the commercial and industrial use. Great, thank you. And the, the last sort of a more general question is, um, are there any sort of industrial or commercial uses that would be excluded from a building if it was mixed use with residential? Would that possibly affect the future leasing of that space? That is a good question. Again, Aaron, if you don't mind me jumping in, we did not exclude um, the uh, specific industrial use from being in uh, and included with the residential. Um, we have altered some of the industrial uses that were allowable, uh, mostly by adding new uses. I think there's a couple that we removed, but we did not put any prohibitions on if you put this industrial use in, you can't use residential, or if there's residential in the building, you can't then move a, this particular new industrial use in there. Okay. Great, thanks, those are my questions, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, Elizabeth Dre? Hi, good evening. Thank you, Elizabeth Dre on Jason Street. Um, this is more, I, I just want to acknowledge I'm totally new to all this and I more have sort of a, a question about the presentation. Um, why, I, I, I guess you, you showed us four different sites. There were four site, different sites that you showed and there was four different sort of scenarios. Um, but each site had a different scenario, so, which it made it really difficult for me to 
understand if you had chosen one site, for example, and applied all four scenarios to it to see whether it would have been financially positive or negative. So I guess, you know, it's obviously a very beginner question, but um, why was that approach chosen in this presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit, um, and maybe Emily as well, about the um, initial sort of build out scenarios that were done um, and how that informed the fiscal analysis or the pro forma analysis that was presented? Sure. If we want to start with the build out, uh, Emily, I'll turn that to you first and then I can talk about the site. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. So uh, we did um, several build out uh, fit studies. And when we do fit studies, what we do is look at the, um, the parcel that exists now. And we test what we're looking at for zoning by kind of trying to fit in the maximum amount of program. And so um, we've done them for several sites uh, throughout the, um, the industrial district and looked at sites of different sizes, um, what happens if you assemble multiple parcels together. When you're doing a fit study, you don't think about who owns what, because what you're doing is you're just simply trying to test the rules. So we tried to get um, several different configurations in, within the different parts of the industrial district. So we could see how the, how the rules and the proposed rules would apply to each. Uh, we tried to make sure that there were some um, along the Minuteman bikeway so that we could test that. Uh, and then we pushed it to sort of the maximum allowable uh, under the rules that we were testing. So that's uh, where we kind of figured out, um, okay, you can have X number of square feet and maybe the FAR is too low and the parking ratios are too high and et cetera to figure that out. Then we turned them over to Eric and his team and from those, Eric, I guess you chose some that we had done and some others that were more representative. So I'll let you talk about that. Sure, yeah, I think the only one that um, I chose that uh, Emily, your team didn't do was the initial one with Petro Genetics. And the only reason I had, had picked that one, as I mentioned before, is it seemed like a, I guess from my perspective, at least a, a likely candidate that, that that sort of development scenario could potentially happen um, given that business and, and that and that building, um, you know, your point is well taken. We we definitely could have tested all four of them on on one individual site or an aggregation of sites. Um, but I was both one trying to um, identify sites in the different industrial districts to try to test different scenarios and see how they might play out, um, and also trying to follow uh, follow on uh, with some of the work that um, Emily had just mentioned on the build out. So. Um, those were the, the reasons why I chose to do it that way. But to your point, we certainly could have picked a singular site and tested for uh, all four of those scenarios on one site. May I ask a quick follow-up question? Erin, is that okay? Yep, sorry, okay. I was on mute. Yes, please no, go okay. ahead. Um, so in, in, the, in the two scenarios where they were not financially positive returns, were those financially positive in different scenarios <laughs> right so yeah yeah I, I think i understand what what you're asking um so without testing the industrial only scenario on on other sites i, I think um in order for that to um be more financially viable i think number one you just building up considerably we tested a building that i think was about twenty six thousand square feet um, to I think a person's point uh, earlier in the comment, we probably could add a little bit more to that build out. That site is a little bigger than maybe what we tested there. One of the challenges with that site is there's an MWRA sewer easement that literally runs down the middle. Um, so if you were to do a little bit more development, you'd have to sort of do it in two buildings uh, on that site. So you, you could fit a little bit more. Um, so I, I think that earlier comment was a point well taken. Um, but I do think you'd have to scale that development up even bigger than probably what could fit on that parcel. So that's one thing, or the land value itself would have to come down in order to, I think, make brand new industrial um, development at current rent levels uh, financially uh, viable. Um, as I mentioned before, with the, with the commercial industrial mixed use, where you have, say, industrial on the first floor and two stories of, say, office above, um, if the land value, if we had tested that potentially on a different site where the land values were lower than the sites that we happen to test it in. I do think that that is a possibility and that could potentially work. 
So I do think that the adjustments that have been made to the proposed zoning um, from a mixed use perspective, dealing specifically with the industrial and the office for a second, I think that may actually allow um, uh, a, a viable uh, mixed use, commercial industrial mixed use product if it was the right site at the right price um, and, and the rents could achieve um, what they would need to for the, for the project to come out um, finan to be financially viable. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, I just don't want to take too much time. I'm still confused, but <laughs> um, I mean, so I guess the second scenario was not financially viable, but would it have been financially viable with, sorry, the second site? Would it have fi been financially viable if you had done any of the three other options to it? I would have to go back and test that to answer that question. I thank don't want to answer it on the fly. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you um, for the question and the comments. Um, uh, Mr. Tassi, you had put up the clapping hand. I'm just curious if you're trying to ask a question. Yes, I was, uh, I was hoping to ask, well, actually not ask a question, but just make a couple of statements. Uh, Absolutely, thank I'm you. Sort of new to this. So um, I, I guess my main concern is with allowing residential in the industrial commercial zone. Um, my rec project is such a huge disappointment to me that it's actually eliminating an office building and substituting uh, residential right in the middle of the industrial zone. And I'm afraid, see residence is easy in Arlington. Everybody, everybody wants to build res uh, residential property. Uh, commercial and industrial is harder. And uh, it, I'm, af I'm afraid that if you're allowing for residential, then the developers will grab onto that and any industrial and commercial parts will just be an afterthought. We'll basically be allowing more residential. And uh, I'm looking for the town to do the harder thing, not the easy residential, but the harder uh, looking for commercial industrial uh, uses. I I'd just as soon see the land stay as it is, then go for more residential uh, on that. Uh, I, I think the commercial and the office will help with taxes. As one person said, not a great deal because uh, there's such a small amount of it. Uh, but I'd very much like to see our Arlington uh, offer jobs as well as bedrooms. And if, if, if we allow, you know, I can't say I'm totally against some residential here or there, but I'm afraid if we allow for any residential you know, it's the camel's nose under the tent and uh, everything's gonna end up that way and the commercial industrial will just be an afterthought and we would have lost whatever chance we have uh, to, uh, uh, to add some diversity to our, to our community. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Rachel, we have uh, one more hand up um, from Stuart, um, unless it's actually Colleen that has a comment. Um, uh, but I, I'm just looking at the time. You've been very uh, gracious with the amount of time you've given for the public comment tonight. Um, can I take the last comment? Yes, yeah, let's, let's take that last comment and then we'll close, um, we'll close public comment for this particular item um, there and then move to any questions that the board might have. Great, thank you. Uh, Stuart, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you for uh, indulging me. I'll be very quick and thanks for the extra qu uh, question. Stuart Borson, 73 Kensington Park. So, so what I'm hearing from a number of people and expressed very, you know, very lucidly by Alan Toasty just now is that there is a strong desire for industrial and office development in the remaining, you know, few parcels that we have. The problem I saw um, from your an analysis is that you know, the land cost and just the economics don't always work out as much as we would like it to work out. And so that's why uh, people started looking at putting residential into the mix. And that seems to make things work better. But as Alan pointed out, you know, residential is easy. So if I was to give this, I'm not the person giving anybody any charge, but if I was to give this organization the charge as to where to move forward, my suggestion would be that rather than looking at residential, seeing that that's how you make money in these projects and throwing up your hands, the thing to do is to figure out what tools are required in order to tip the balance in favor of industrial or office uses. And again, I mentioned earlier, maybe 
you know, too briefly, but taxes or incentives put in by the town or zoning changes, strengthened zoning changes. The question should be, you know, addressed in the in the, the final report is how do you make industrial work in Arlington without, you know, having to do uh, residential? So that's my my thought here, my suggestion. I thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Um, Rachel, I'll turn it back to you for comments from the board. Great, thank you. And, and thank you to Eric, Emily, and, and Aaron for the um, presentation and for your thoughtful answers to everybody's questions who, and, and comments who posed them this evening. I really appreciate all the time you spent with us tonight. Uh, I'll just go through our, our list of board members uh, for any comments or questions that you'd like to share or any clarifications that you'd like to ask. So we'll start with Ken. Uh, well, thank you for um, um, what you've done here. I, I think this is good. Um, I like the bonus structure of, with the height and so forth like that. And I, I want to stay away from right now the mixed use because I think there's two, there, was, there was quite a bit of talk about that already. I want to address a few other things. Uh, if we want to encourage industrial or commercial space in these areas here, uh, let's think of um, an owner of, of a company or uh, a developer. What is, uh, why would they build here? And um, I think we can't, one thing we can't control is the land value because it is what it is. Um, but what we can't control is maybe uh, transportation to a certain degree. So I think what we have to look at is maybe having um, you know, carpooling from, from these workspaces to um, parking, uh, parking structures elsewhere where they, they can commute in earlier or other areas where we say, hey, we have a resource here in Arlington we have a bunch of very smart people that live here that, that could potentially just walk or bike to these areas. And there's, there's, a, there's a pool of, employ, uh, uh, of desirable employees. Uh, I think that's, those are some other things we should look into that could, that could actually encourage someone to pay the premium to develop uh, or operate uh, space here in Arlington. I think we have to look broader than just, you know, what, you know, we can build more height or we add housing. I think we have to look at the actual, you know, we, you know, desire of people working here. They can, they can, they can uh, work here. They can walk a park during lunchtime, easy access to restaurants, all those things that would encourage employees that would want to work here as opposed to in a industrial park somewhere else or an office park somewhere else. There's a quaint community here that people want to work here because they want to live around where they work. I think that's something we have to actually look into a little bit more. And uh, that's what I was, I was seeing as comments. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Aaron, did you want to uh, address anything there or do you want me to just take I, I'm happy to just take all of the comments from the board and then and have you address at the end unless there's something specific that you'd like to respond to um I I don't have anything specific to respond to um with Ken but I I'd be happy to hear the complement of comments from um the board and then give a response wonderful thank you thank you uh David I really appreciate the work that uh, Emily and Eric and their team have done on, on the project. Uh, and I think uh, the economic uh, analysis that we uh, saw tonight uh, from the, uh, the performance scenarios, uh, I think was, was illuminating, but I, I think as we've already discussed, um, uh, you could, you could, spin out more and more scenarios to, to try to dig into that even further. Um, I, I really appreciate the input from the public and uh, I, I share some of the concerns that have been expressed. Uh, Arlington has lost um, 
uh, one commercial or industrial parcel after another over the last several decades to uh, purely residential development in many cases. And I think um, with the scenarios that we've looked at uh, being somewhat pessimistic on doing purely commercial and industrial uh, redevelopment in in the industrial zones, um, you know, I, I certainly see um, how that creates an incentive to to want to allow some level of of residential development alongside uh, the commercial and, and industrial. But I, I really do feel strongly that we we need to um, make sure that we are guarding against uh, the residential components becoming predominant uh, in our in our quest to to uh, spur development in those zones. Thanks. Thank you, David. Gene. Yeah. Um, good evening. Um, yeah. Thank you for the good presentations. Great questions from the public and really good answers. I think that um, the the consultants and the working group have done really great work on this. And I think what we're going to get out of it, I hope, is a new structure of how things can be built and developed in the industrial zones. And then it will be up to the town to do what Ken and some other people have suggested, which is apply other tools that are available to try to attract the right development to the area. But really the first step is to figure out what the zoning should really look like in the industrial zones so we can move on to use those other tools to get in industry, commercial, et cetera, there. So I think this is a necessary first step. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the actual proposed um, zoning changes that come out of the next zoning bylaw working group meeting. I like the bonuses and incentives. I think they're absolutely, you know, what's done these days in lots of places. So we're not sort of inventing something new, but using something that's good and that has worked in other places. Um, I'm not opposed to residential in the zone. I understand, you know, the reasons why some of it will help round out the zone and might help with finances in some place. I think I share everybody else's concern that we don't want it to become a residential zone with token industrial or commercial. And I think one of the um, tasks of what comes out of the zoning bylaw working group is to have a proposed regulation that will not, not allow residential to overwhelm the commercial and industrial. Um, I think one of the nice things about allowing residential here that nobody's mentioned is that there's gonna be enough residential to spark um, the, the um, inclusionary zoning by law. And we should get some more affordable housing here, which is something that we sorely need in Arlington. I think that would be good. I'm just wondering, I saw our comments, but I have a question I'll sort of put in here now. Um, I'm interested in whether there was some thought about having artist working living space and if there's a way to incentivize that because that's often a, a nice thing to have in these sorts of areas. So I know that's encompassed by residential, but was there any thought of any way to perhaps incentivize it? Uh, I guess um, I we can jump in right here. Um, it is um, an allowed use um, for artists live workspace as um, part of the zoning. Um, it, uh, Emily, anything in particular that you wanted to mention related to artists live workspace? No, um, it's not incentivized. It is allowed, it's not incentivized and there would have to be a separate structure that's instituted so that it could be confirmed that um, the people who are using the artist live work are in fact artists. Um, uh, we talked about a couple of different ways, uh, different communities do it differently. Um, some have it, the requirements within the zoning itself, which seemed um, not only onerous, but unworkable. So we've, we've proposed uh, an alternative in the draft zoning 
um, to take care of that. The idea of incentivizing is an interesting one. Um, I'd have to think about that one a little bit further. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd like you to think about, is there a way to do that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, I like the emphasis on the environmental issues in this. I think that's really terrific. And it's clearly the way the town, the state, the world needs to go in a lot of ways. You know, last time you did a presentation, I was a little concerned about the definition of solar ready because it was only photo, photovoltaic and yet that's still here. But I'm gonna quote to you from um, the um, Solar Ready Buildings Planning Guide of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in which they identify three types of solar ready, photovoltaic, solar hot water, and solar ventilation preheat systems. I'm not at all familiar with the third. I'm familiar with the first two, but it sort of seems to me that our definition of solar ready needs to be big enough. So it's not only solar voltaic, but also uh, solar thermal and maybe solar ventilation preheat. Although I'm not sure what that is. So I can't comment about that one in particular. I'm also, I would also prefer the electric charging stations for cars to be mandatory and not optional. They're not very expensive, you know, and if they're mandatory, they happen. And I don't, I don't see them as being the breaking point for any particular development. Um, yeah, I did like the pro formers. I, I don't know some of the details that people mentioned. It was really helpful and very instructive to see those. One of the things that I'm concerned about here, and I don't know if it's come up or if you've talked about it, is the potential for site contamination because most of these old industrial sites have some level of site contamination. And I wonder if that's come up and has been part of the discussion in terms of sort of the finances because it sort of seems to me that if it's there somewhere in the background, you know, the town can sort of start thinking about, you know, how to work with whoever the developers on Brownfield's tax credits and all those other sort of good things. So I'm just wondering whether that's been part of the discussion. Uh, it has come up, um, but we have not done um, a parcel by parcel analysis to understand what sort of contamination would be um, on each site that would be in the, that's in the industrial districts. Um, it's also typically, you know, the owner or the previous owner's responsibility to address those issues and not necessarily something that the town would, um, would be uh, a party to other than perhaps some, some overseeing. It's, it's, um, it would be permitting through the DEP primarily. Right, and we probably don't even know the contamination on the sites because they might never have looked for them, but if they start doing construction, or if they right. need construction loans, they then might have to actually Correct. get that and find out. So I, I, yeah, I don't know what to do with that other than to say it might affect, you know, some of the financials um, that you've looked at for some of those things. And I don't know whether it's worth mentioning that somewhere in the report or not. I leave that up to you. I just sort of put that out there as something to consider. Um, Yeah, I think I, I'll sort of close up with, you know, I think we need to do this. Although what this is, I think will probably be tweaked a little bit because if we don't, I don't think the industrial zones can reach a potential where it creates more workspaces for people in the town and more tax revenue for town. So we clearly need to do something about this. And then the town is going to need a process once this is in place to be able to do all the things that lots of people have talked about to make them happen. You know, one of the one of the disappointing things that just happened was the T cutting back on a lot of the bus service into Arlington. And we just hope that that will be reversed when the pandemic's over. But the last thing we need in town and for our industrial zones is to eliminate the 79 bus and to combine some of the other buses. So I think that's just another thing for the town to work on, but thank you very much. This was great and I really appreciated the presentation and all the work.
Thank you, Jean. Katie? Um, like my board members, I just wanted to share um, my appreciation for the incredible work that's gone into this, this really clear presentation that um, I think outlines um, a lot of uh, really sort of exciting regulatory steps for our um, industrial zones. And I'm really excited to see sort of the next steps and the specific proposals that you guys come up with um, with the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Um, so my comment is primarily, um, you know, in line with some of the conversations we've already been having during this meeting, to say that um, I do really see, and I think you guys made a compelling case for why we need residential in these industrial zones. And I very much see my colleagues' perspective as well as that of members of the public that we don't want to let the residential overwhelm. Um, but I think also acknowledging both broader economic trends, our community's desperate need for housing. Um, I think taking those things in concert, um, it makes a really compelling case for including housing. And so one thing that I'm just encouraging you guys to think through as you start um, you know, thinking about the public process for these kinds of um, zoning um, bylaws, you know, these zoning bylaw proposals is um, thinking about sort of other models um, for other communities that have implemented these kinds of proposals and this kind of mixed use zoning um, in industrial districts. That we're not the only place to consider these kinds of changes. This is pretty typical given that Arlington is hardly alone in facing these kinds of economic constraints. And so I think really clearly outlining sort of why this is necessary um, and why how this can be possible. And actually I would say enhance um, sort of the industrial districts in a lot of ways to have that kind of mixed use development. So anyway, that, that's my only comment. Um, thank you for this. Great, thank you, Katie. And I'll, I'll just add that um, following um, whichever, whatever the final format of the, the zoning recommendations are recommended and um, you know, potentially adopted, I agree with Ken that as a, as a next step, creating that value proposition for um, incentivizing and attracting commercial and industrial development by really identifying the um, highly desirable workforce from a recruitment and retention standpoint and all of the other, um, all of the other uh, items that go into that type of a value proposition is a really important step for the, for the town in terms of marketing, marketing this. Um, and, and I, I too, um, in addition to what several members of the public have indicated as well as several of my colleagues, um, very much in favor of more limits and restrictions on the amount of residential that can be included in, um, in, the, in these developments um, as well. I think it's really important for it to be um, primarily commercial and industrial in its final format. Uh, any, other, any other questions or comments uh, before, we, before we close? Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the time and effort. And again, the um, especially the, the really thoughtful responses that you've given to all of the, the questions and comments that have come up this evening. That's been very helpful. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for the time. And, and thanks to um, Eric and Emily for joining us this evening. Um, we, we appreciate their work. Um, I think we, we have a good understanding of what, of what the conversation needs to focus on with the working, uh, excuse me, the zoning bylaw working group coming up in January. Um, so uh, I think we have our marching orders. Um, Jenny, do you have anything to add at this juncture? Just to thank um, Aaron and um, Emily and Eric for all of your work on this and also the work of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group um, who've really been helping to give a lot of feedback and, and input along the way um, and sort of grappling with some of the challenging issues of what we have left and available that's industrial and commercial and what we can actually do with it. So very much appreciate the conversation and the presentation and all of the comments. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you all. And with that, we will close agenda item number six and move to agenda item number seven, which is the open public forum. So uh, for tonight's open forum, any member of the public who uh, wishes to uh, speak, um, please use the raise hand function. Um, as a reminder, you will be asked to identify yourself, uh, your name and your address, and then you will be given uh, three minutes to, to speak uh, with any comment that you would like to 
um, make to address the board. Okay, and I do not see any, uh, any right now. So I will close open forum. Uh, and that is our agenda for this evening. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Is there a second? Second. Take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you all very much, everyone who attended and for all of our speakers this evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays. Have a nice Christmas. Good night. Happy holidays. Yep. Good night. Happy holidays. Thank you.